And welcome back to the Demon Land Podcast. My name is Andy. And it's been 20,820 days since we last sat atop the AFL ladder at the end of a home and away season. And how fitting was it to bury our footy demons at the very same venue where we reached our lowest ebb over a decade ago. You could not have scripted it any better. One versus two on the ladder facing off in the last match of the regular season. A true David and Goliath battle when comparing the two teams over the last decade. The D's had only beaten the Cats at that venue 17 times in 80 years. For any team, the travel down the Prince's Highway is a daunting task and one that in recent time the D's have had few successes and many more failures. Be they humiliating, crushing defeats or nail-biting, gut-wrenching, heartbreaking losses. A win would net either team top spot and their pick of a finals venue. A loss would see them face off against a hostile crowd in Adelaide. The script didn't seem to be going to plan for the Demons when we found ourselves 44 points down and staring right down the barrel of another devastating defeat at the hands of the experienced Cats. But the Demons of 2021 are a different breed. They don't lay down and die. They embody the true spirit of of the team from yesteryear for which their demon name was derived. Fittingly, the Ds clawed their way back into contention and put the final nail in the Cats' coffin with their first ever win after the siren from a true captain's goal from Max Gorn. Joining me tonight to talk about that historic win is longtime Demon Lander George. Good evening, George. Good evening, Andy. Good evening, all the Demon Landers out there. Um, We're hoping everyone has recovered by the time you're listening to this uh, podcast. That's only 48 hours since the uh, since the game, and uh, hopefully, as well during this session, we'll find out whether uh, everyone's MFCSS is actually better or worse as a result of this game. Well, I was thinking about that. My MFCSS uh, is actually worse now because we have a weight of expectation on us. Uh, not saying I would have liked to ha- have lost, but it's put the pressure on. We are. We've now become. You know, we've been hunted all all year. Um, uh, so. Yeah, the pressure is on, and uh, we can only disappoint ourselves from here. <laughs> uh, also joining us tonight, a man who had every confidence in us taking out the minor premiership, despite not wanting to win the minor premiership. Uh, good evening, uh, B-Man. How are you? Good evening, Andy. I'm good, thanks. Good evening, George. Good evening, Demon Landers. And uh, I'd like to big shout out to you, Andy, for tipping against the Ds this week. It's uh, worked a treat again, and um, uh, what an amazing match. I'm not in a tipping competition for finals, but I will be tipping against us for the remainder uh, of the season. I'll take one do, for the team. Do please, yeah, put your tips in. Um, well, where where do we start? There's so much to talk about tonight, so so perhaps I'll start by uh, getting your your general fin- feelings on finishing uh, on top. Uh, this is uncharted territory for many Demons fans, particularly those of us who are either too young to remember the 50s or the 60s uh, or just weren't, like myself, weren't born till after the Golden Era. Um, how do you feel about the minor premiership, discarding the fact that the mission is obviously not over and the second phase does start now? But how are you feeling about the 2021 home and away season in general? And I might start with you, George. At the start of the year, um, everyone may remember that uh, Gary Pert and the, and the board came out with a strategic plan to um, finish in the top four to give us the best chance of a premiership. And that is exactly what this team and what this club has achieved. And I think it's too easy to forget that in the, all the excitement. Uh, this wasn't just a single game. This was the result of a lot of hard work by the players and the club in the background, particularly in in uh, tr- very trying circumstances that we've seen through the whole year. And we have exactly done what we intended to do. And I'm reminded of 
uh, Brendan Gale at Richmond when it, when he came out and said the same sort of thing when he was first appointed as um, general manager uh, down there. Everyone laughed at him when he said they'd have 75,000 members, members and uh, three premierships or whatever it was within the next five years, and they delivered the same way. Um, we've, we've done the same now. So uh, finishing at the very top was, was very nice icing on the cake, but we know that in order to have a genuine chance at the premiership, you've basically got to finish top four in this competition, and we've achieved that. So... Um, yeah, it was a very pleasing result for the whole season for the club and the supporters have been so, um, so uh, not not reliable, and so devoted to the club over such a long period of time. It's just rewards for us, even at this stage. Big man. Yeah, I've um, been following the D's. Um, so I'm born '67 and been following them passionately since about '72. Started going to to games regularly probably 76, 77 by myself because I didn't know any other Melbourne fans so when I was 10, 11. Um, to finish top on the end at the end of the home and away season, to be honest, I didn't even think about how much it meant to me till after we'd achieved it. Um, and then, you know, it was so evident how much it meant to the club. Um, and, you know, we might talk about Petrarca's interview lately that had me in tears afterwards. Um, I, I think it, it means a lot. It technically means a lot just in the terms of the um, not having a six-day break playing Port at home. I mean, that's a, there was a lot to play for in that game in terms of that result. Um, but I think it's actually a really good result in the sense that um, we are the best team in the AFL at the moment. I, there's no question in my mind. Um, if you look at, um, you know, we've beaten every team in the top eight. Um, our top record against top four teams is by far the best. Um, you know, our record on any measure um, is better than anyone else in the AFL, uh, given who we've had to play um, and play twice, um, Geelong twice, including Geelong at Geelong. Um, we deserve to um, finish top of the table and um, I would have um, been sort of disappointed in hindsight if the Cats had made it because, as I've sort of said previously, I don't rate them. I mean, I probably underrate them to be fair to them, but um, um, I don't rate them as good a team as us. So I, I think it, the best team finished on top. Um, you know, there's a question that's a good question about well, what benefit does that get get a club, um, and should there be more benefit to it, like a sort of draft bonus or something, or a um, financial benefit? Um, but leaving that aside, um, I think the fact that the last time we did it, 1964, there's got a lot of synergy about it. Um, and, uh, you know, it was a hugely uh, meaningful result, wasn't it, in terms of the win? Um, just the other thought I had was, I guess, sort of the perspective of things is that, you know, thinking about finals and on the eve of finals, sort of the thought of not seeing Melbourne, um, you know, I know there's bigger thing, fish to fry for everyone and, you know, there's a risk of losing perspective on these things. But, if, you know, I was str- really struggling, to be honest, with the thought of finals coming um, and not being able to see us, um, particularly, obviously, a grand final. But I feel like I sort of turned a corner a little bit on that and the game helped that. Um, and so I think that, you know, Demon Land's been a terrific balm for that. Um, you know, and, you know, seeing all the passion online for, for the Ds has been terrific for that. But to be honest, that win was as good a win, good an experience of a win since I went to see the Ds in 87, win that last game at Western Oval to, uh, and then wait for Hawks to beat Geelong down at Cadinia Park. Um, that, so it sort of felt like, you know, if it's to be this year, um, then so be it. Um, and I'll still really love the journey. Um, but, you know, the other thing I was thinking is this team has got a serious shot at um, a flag for the next three, four, five years. So we'll get our shot at September, uh, going to the G in September, D's fans. And um, um, so I'm really going to embrace this season for, for what it's got to offer. And I'm, I'm really enjoying the journey. I've, I can't tell you how many, you know, when I was younger and I used to read, do you remember that book? There was this book, Every Game Ever Played, and it had every year, every game, and, and then the ladder at the end, and I used to flip through that and look at the years and saw all the years that, you know, the 50s and 60s and, and wherever else that the Ds had finished on top, but, you know, there were obviously slim pickings as you got towards the end of that book, 
uh, a good chunk of it. Uh, and then, you know, when I was in my sort of teen years, we, we you know, started playing finals and, and that was great and a great feeling, but we never finished on top of the ladder. I know there's still a lot of water to go under a bridge and there's still four more games you've got to win, three or four more games you've got to win and play well. And obviously, if we're out in straight sets, that, that top of the ladder is all for naught. But it, I, it's given me such, such uh, pleasure all year to see us up there. And we, we were on top of the ladder for, I think, 13 weeks of the year, um, much more than anyone else. I mean, uh, Geelong, for example, have not been top the whole year. Um, and look, uh, as I said, doesn't mean anything if in the end... You're not there at the end of on the last day of September, um, but it still it gave me uh, such pride to sort of see that, and then seeing all the the reactions of of these fans online, and and then watching the game, and we'll talk about our own reactions in a minute uh, uh, about the game. But uh, yeah, probably one of the best uh, Melbourne wins I've ever seen. And and like you, Bin Man, I I was really struggling about not being able to go to finals and all that, but I think I'm. Mm. I think I've come to terms with that, that I'm not going to see them in the grand final and I'm okay with that. Um, the, the feeling that I had on Saturday night just winning a game that in the end might not mean anything, um, mm. yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll watch anytime, anywhere, wherever I have to watch it, if I have to watch it on a TV, um, sitting by myself in a room and waking up my kids, um, yeah, <laughs> anytime, anywhere. Um, the other thing, just briefly about finishing top, is that it, I mentioned a few weeks ago that Hawthorne was the last team to finish top and win the flag, and that was back in 2013. Hawks were by far the best team that um, year. Um, and you look back and think, well, it makes sense that they won the flag. I think there's a bit of a furphy that's been, you know, I'm hearing a lot of it on the radio and people talking about how even this year is. Um, I just disagree with it. I, I think that, you know, there's been talk about teams right down to six being, you know, um, have a chance. I just don't see it. And, and I think we are genuinely a cut above every other team. And um, so I think that not only does it, it's recognition of that. Um, I think that there's a chance that we'll, you know, we'll look back and go, all oh, right, well, how come people didn't rate um, the D's more highly? They were evidently the better team. They got the most points. They only got beaten, you know, by nine points, whatever, 11 points in a draw or whatever. That You know, they beat everyone around them. Um, so, you know, it's, I, I just think that it's good recognition of that, but also it's, you know, I think it does demonstrate um, where a cut above. Okay, myself on mute. I think a lot of people still don't trust us. They still see us as that basket case from years ago. Um, so they, we just don't have that uh, credit in the bank yet. Uh, and, and I'm happy for people to underrate us and not and not rate us, and we'll uh, take them by surprise. Hopefully, uh, just on the ladder positions, Bim Man, you, you've, you've you mentioned how Hawthorne uh, are the only recent teams. Was that 2012? What was it? Or would you remember? Twitter, yeah. Uh, so I, I don't know if you saw this, but I tagged you in a post on Demonland today uh, from Useless AFL Stats uh, on Facebook. The home and away positions of teams to have won a flag since the current final eight system. Uh, first position, 28.6%. Second, 33.3%. Third, 33.3%. Fourth, zero. No team has won it from fourth in this final eight seri- uh, system. And then fifth to eighth has 4.8%, but I believe that's just uh, seventh position being the Bulldogs uh, in 2016. Um, right. So there you go. How far back does that go? That go Well, when was the final eight? We were in the final eight in 2000. Was there a final eight previous to that? Um, unless George yeah, knows it. Yeah, 97, I think. So, yeah, so 23, 24 years, right? Yep, there you go. So, um, yeah. And I think I think out of that stat, it tells you that even if you finish one or two, you've got more than fifty percent chance of winning the premiership. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the other thing is that those I maintain that there's probably something about that. Um, you know, second versus third is is generally going to be a really high pressure match, where often one v four and probably indicative of the fact that fourth haven't won it um, is is less. And is that such a good preparation for um, a um, elimination? Uh, prelim um but that's sort of taken off the table a bit this year one because 
we just had the match that we played. So what brilliant preparation for the finals. Uh, and two, with all of that's happening, um, the advantage that um, that we got over Geelong, for instance, you know, it's not inconsiderable on, on a couple of levels. One, obviously, we don't have to play port in port. Um, in, you know, the only team that will get the opportunity to play in front of their home team, these finals, are their home fans. Um, but two, and this is a really big factor for Geelong, huge factor for Geelong, there's no pre-finals buy and they're playing a six-day break. Um, that's going to be a big issue for Geelong coming into that game. Uh, and would have been for us less so because we're, we're, I don't think, you know, our fitness is better. Um, we've got a younger list as well. But nonetheless, a six-day break in front of a home crowd is not something that you uh, wanted. And, um, you know, halfway through that third quarter, that's what I was thinking about. Um, 1994 was the first year of a final eight, uh, but I'm not sure if their stats, because they did say under the current system, and I believe the final eight system was a little bit different early in the early days of the final eight. But uh, anyway, we'll move on. Um since we're uh, talking about uh, feelings, how was your feelings during the match and particularly during the nine unanswered goal period? Uh, could you see our season falling away from us? I know we've got finals, but it's not good to get thumped in that last game. Uh, we were being taken to the cleaners by one of our biggest competitors in the race for the flag on the eve of finals. Uh, we were facing another daunting trip into enemy territory in front of a hostile crowd in Adelaide, off a six-day break, as you mentioned, B-Man. And we'll get into the nuts and bolts of how we ended up in that position a bit later. We'll talk about you know talk about it in things. But what was your mood like? What was the mood like, B-Man, in the B-Man household after we went forty-four points down? Uh, it was then? Uh, it was after that end-to-end -end play that ended with a, a Gary Rowan uh, goal about twenty minutes into the third quarter. What, what was the mood like? Well, I watch it. I've got a sort of room out um, in a converted what was our carport. Now it's a converted sort of cinema, and so it's brick walled in. <laughs> so I was in the dark out there with my big TV screen by myself because my family's not really interested. Um, uh, it didn't feel like nine um, unanswered goals because um, one was on the other side of the um, the the third uh, the break, wasn't it? So. Yeah. Um, and the first couple of them came was the Hawkins goal, um, and then, you know it didn't feel like it. They were part of that run. It was that group of five goals in five minutes. That's like, oh, what the hell's going on here? Um, like I, to be honest, I wasn't overly sort of you know obviously flat, but I was, it can happen. It was almost the outlier that. Um, you know, it's the exception that proves a rule. I was sort of thinking ahead to the, the podcast and Demon Land and people saying that, you know, we've been unlocked and, you know, finally this is, we're not going to make it, we're terrible and all of that stuff. And um, and I watched the replay immediately afterwards. <laughs> I watched it again that game. Yeah, I watched um, the last quarter. And to check partly to my, my sense of it. And, you know, we were in that, it was just a blip. It was a bizarre five or six minutes. Um, and so... I can't say that I was, you know, overly, you know, I wasn't upset in the way that I've been previously. You know, it was just one of those things in a game of footy where they got a hold of us in a patch and we couldn't stop them. And I, my, I was flat when we got, after their first goal in the third quarter to take it to 44 points, we got the next one. I was really flat after they got the next one to take it out to 44 um, yeah. points again because I think there was only seven minutes 53 seconds or something to go, um, not that I've memorised it, um, <laughs> at that time. And I thought, right, okay, that's we're not coming back from here because I hadn't given up at half time. I thought, well, we've got to get rolling. And when we didn't, you know, I thought we played all right in the third quarter. We were on top again, um, but we just weren't pulling that lead back. Um, but once they got that second goal to, you know, we needed, I thought we needed to keep rolling once we got up to 38 points. Um, so I was already thinking, well, we're not going to win. I just hope we don't, you know, fold up our tent too badly from here because that could mean um, trouble if we play them again. Um, so, yeah, I do, probably that's the only point I got really despondent um, at that when they got that goal back to get it to 44 points. George, how was the, how was the mood where you were? I, I, I suspect like a lot of uh, Demon fans, once it got out to the 44-point mark in the third quarter, um, you're playing you know, a top-two side um, who um, are, have been performing quite well during the season. I think that had 16 wins, wasn't it? Um, I didn't see us coming back from that. I thought a, a, an honourable loss at that stage was, was 
more than adequate. Um, I was preparing for Adelaide, thinking, oh, well, Adelaide against Port may not be all that bad. We've done well against them. Uh, but uh, I was looking at a number of players and had looked at a number of players in the, up to that, um, certainly the, just the halfway mark and the, even early in the third quarter, um, we were being beaten on a number of uh, positions which were just critical and I just couldn't see us coming back. It wasn't just that the scoreboard was seven goals behind. It was um, we weren't playing the way that we usually did and have, have done so when we've been able to come back. We weren't in the game um, in these critical positions. Um, Geelong were beating us comprehensively, particularly in the middle, uh, and certainly didn't expect what what came out of that, but the thing to remember, I think, is let, you know, let's not get too excited about this. If, if but for one or two individual circumstances in the game, which we'll talk about, we could have lost that game and the conversation would be completely different. But that's the nature of um, finals com- uh, football. It's great that we've actually seen um, this high-pressure game in the lead-up to the finals. We know what we're going to get now. We're a team that... Um, has hasn't played finals for three years, but we now know what we're up against, and we've come out of it. And the amount of belief that will come to the team simply by winning um, will be more than what uh, we would have got, uh, even if we got back to within a point or two, or or gone down honourably. So, yeah, I was I was resigned to it at that stage, but um, even more ecstatic when when the result came out even better. I was so despondent, um, as you can imagine. The uh, MFCSS was raging inside of me. Um, I was thinking, uh, I, I was just, oh, look, like you, George, I, I thought, look, okay, we can reset, we can go to port, we've beaten them before, but obviously it's a daunting task, finals, um, you know, crowd, you know, all that has to happen is they get a good start and that's that's it, you know. If, if they get 20, 30 points up early <laughs> against us, we're, we're toast. Uh, I really didn't think we had it in us to, to get back and um, it's just remarkable that we did and, and a testament to the players. But, yeah, I was very despondent. My wife had come in, just had a look at the, the score and she was like, oh, boy, because, uh, as you know, I've got some nephews who we have an ongoing bet with their Geelong, big Geelong supporters. They were texting me, giving it to me. Um, we have Our bets involves uh, me we're having to wear a, a Geelong jumper or them a Melbourne jumper, which has only happened once in their, their lives. Um, that's the, the bet is who finishes higher on the ladder. Um, so they were asking me what jumper size, or they were giving it to me. Uh, but no surprise, I haven't heard from them since. Um, <laughs> But yeah, absolutely just wonder. But let's uh, we'll talk about the match in more detail in a moment. But uh, how I want to talk about uh, the end of the game. How how were your nerves uh, as we started clawing our way back into the match? And more importantly, uh, were you were you confident with the ball in Max's hand for a shot at goal to win a match after the siren? We've discussed a few, even a few weeks ago. We which player we'd like to see uh, in that position? Actually, I think we, I think we were discussing who you wouldn't want to be in that position. And Max, as much as I love the guy to death, he wouldn't be my first pick to take the kick. Uh, close in, far out, doesn't matter. I think I'd prefer him further out. Um, so take me through the emotions, the thoughts, feelings during that final minute or in the last quarter. No doubt the celebrations that shook the house and woke up the neighbour's cat, pardon the pun. Um, B-Man, you want to start with you? Yeah, I'm, I'm relatively – so I generally watch the games by myself and as I said, it's out in this room that's that's pretty soundproof. Um, and I'm generally pretty – you know, I don't get up and about um, by, you know, by myself. Um, but um, when I watch, you know, the games and sort of I get a bit angsty, but not too badly. But, geez, I was screaming and, um, um, you know, you could feel the momentum going and it's a great thing to watch in footy when a team gets momentum. And we got back within, I forget the number, but, you know, we were within six or seven points with 14 minutes to go with that that game. And it was one of those classic momentum games where we had it. They just needed to find a way way to stop it. But um, I've got a good mate who's sort of talked about this phenomenon um, a a lot that there's statistically it's extremely hard to come back from more than five goals. It doesn't happen very often. So, you know, obviously you can remember what it does, but the number on that is really low. Um, And one of the reasons for that is, is teams often get, 
you know, even for the lead we had, the 44 points, they get close and then it's really hard then to, to get in front. It just seems to be the phenomenon of, you know, you, you get the momentum going, you get close, you're the one with all of the, the sort of energy and as it becomes apparent that you've got a chance, teams often seem to freeze up a little bit or stop and that's that's almost exactly what happened in this match because I think um, we got within six points, I think, with a full eight or nine minutes to go, was it? Uh, we, like the, um, we were... Fritch, Fritch's goal, when Fritch goal to bring us within two points, there were still nearly 10 minutes of game time left. And But previous to that, we'd actually uh, whittled it back to that seven-point margin, I think, at that stage, uh, within the first 10 minutes of the of the, of the the uh, quarter. So yeah. we, went for, we, got, we got the first 10 minutes. We clawed it almost completely back. Fritch's goal took another five minutes. And, the, and then it was you know, down to the wire for the remaining you know, 15, uh, 10 minutes of the game. Well, B-Man, yeah. when you talk about, uh, before you go on, when you talk about uh, in the past about teams not being able to sort of you know, get there, you've got to remember there's that 666 now. So you can't stack the back line, which would have happened yeah. years ago when, it, when teams started getting close. So it sort of made it harder for teams yeah, to, to win because true. it was, you know. That's true. I, but there's also that psychological element because, you you know, in that first 10 minutes, we're completely free um, and, you know, they're not. Um, but then it sort of gets real and, um, you know, all they needed to do really is kick a goal and it would have scuttled that. So I was going bananas for those first 10 minutes. I mean, when Melbourne play like that, when we're sweeping down the field in groups and we're swarming and, you know, we're running ahead of the ball and you've got the sort of that, the goal that Fritch kicked, the one that I think Cozzy kicked over the top, that was such a beautiful kick. And that's the classic Melbourne goal when we're up in a bit bout. We've got no one in the forward 50. He runs into an open goal pretty much. Um, yeah, I was going bananas. And um, um, and you know, just the ending was next level. So I, I just went crazy. I was screaming as loud as I could. I was just my throat was stuffed afterwards. Yeah, um, I was too. just <laughs> devastated when they paid that free kick for uh, against um, Gus for deliberate. One, I couldn't believe it. So I was just going nuts on it. Two, um, I thought thirty four seconds at that point. You know, he's got to kick down the line. That's that's going to be it. Um, so, um, and for the finish of it, I was, I just, I actually thought he'd kick it. Um, I, he just sort of had a look about him and it just seemed, you know, it seems a bit sort of silly, but it sort of seemed preordained the whole way that, that finished that game, um, that there was something else there or that place. So, um, you know, I thought it was, a, geez, you'd be furious if you're a Cats fan because mm-hmm. Stanley just had a complete brain fade should have obviously been marking gone, but you know, they allowed that to happen. I mean, fatigue obviously played a factor in that, that, but um, to say they handed it to us in the end, didn't they? George, how were your feelings? What, uh, did you get any noise complaints? Uh, I, I, what I did get during the week was an Apple Watch, and that measures your heartbeat. Oh, I've been talking about it all of the last two years. Yeah, uh, normal resting heartbeat fifty four. Last five minutes one hundred and twenty four. So. I, I must say I haven't had an alert this year, so I'm doing something hard. I had a yeah. cheap Audi one, and it blew up. <laughs> uh, look, it was really exciting. I, I. Um, it was early in it was early in that final quarter when um, in the in the same way that Geelong did to us in the second quarter um, the number of goals that were piled on in a really short period of time um, you know, we, we got off to a great start in that in that final quarter and you know, we had we kicked what was it five five goals or four goals within the first 10 minutes it was just incredible um, how quickly it came and and all of it that just changed the whole perception of the uh, of what was to be the ultimate outcome, but um, yeah, certainly um, uh, in that in that last minute, when when Max finally kicked that goal, um, the poor dog left the house through the dog door, and I don't think we've seen her since. <laughs> I, I must the, say, um, sorry, Andy, the hit where they ran into each other, um, the two Geelong players up in their forward line. I thought that was it because they had an open forward line. Hmm. That hit, either one of them pick up that ball, and they probably yeah, score they a peel, goal. Peel, so peel off from each other. Last ten minutes was. Just berserk. Um, yeah, I must say, as we were sort of piling on the goals, I wasn't sort of paying attention to, to what the margin was. And I di- it didn't click until the commentator said, I think it was after Spargo kicked the goal and they said seven points. I'm like, and looked and there was 14 minutes ago. Oh, my God, we're, 
a chance. I, I, I knew we were kicking goals, but it just from that had that forty four points in my head, and I just I had them realise that we'd whittled it down. Um, then when Max, they, yeah, I I I've never had the reaction that I've had from a game of football ever. Look what look we haven't won a premiership in my lifetime, so I don't have that. But uh, we don't. We've never won a game after the siren. And never, 124 never. years, and it's never happened. And never for the stakes. And I know it's only the minor premiership, and Richmond supporters with their three premiership cups are probably laughing at us for it. But there were there were some stakes in this, and we, I, I, like I like I think Goodwin said after the match, you know, he was happy that they got the emotion out, and they'll now you know sort of reel it back in and and get set on the next week. But and I've watched the replay of Max's kick probably 200 times, if not more. I've seen it over and over again. I, I, I keep thinking he's going to miss it. I, I've watched the last quarter. I keep thinking we're not going to get that 50-metre penalty. And I, just the, the – it felt – I don't know, maybe because I've never experienced a premiership, but it, it sort of felt like it, yeah, I had that uh, that emotion um, f- from it. And I, I – bloody well hope uh, if we get into the grand final that it's not another close one even though that would be the greatest feeling to win a grand final like that would be fantastic i just want to if we do make it a nice comfortable seven goal win uh, uh, 90 <laughs> points just so my heart beats not racing throughout the game um yeah i'll take just a business-like win um but yeah that, that was just a fantastic feeling and um i have experienced over and over and over again this week watching it again um and yeah well let's get stuck into talking about, just before we uh, yeah. do Andy and Joey what what I actually didn't feel miss the crowd in this game what about you guys did you I thought that I, and I don't know if this has been an improvement in the crowd noises which I'm not a fan of but I recognize that you have to have it but I think it's much better like when you listen yeah, to the replay yeah. it sounds more natural I don't know if they've they've actually taped sick crowd sounds and are using it better and over the year and yeah. a half, two years, they've they've perfected it, but it was much better. And they turned the volume up on the on the players, and it's quite interesting hearing them talk to yeah. each other. Sorry, George. Yeah, the crowd the crowd one. I, I noticed that they've actually got uh, obviously a ball button. Um, yeah, you know, when somebody ah, gets tackled, um, you, you now get hear the crowd shouting out "ball" like they always do um, during that point of the game. So yeah, it's much more realistic than it was for a start. Yeah, they've definitely improved. I, I forgot to mention when we did win, I, square, I like you, uh, big man, I've got uh, sort of a theatre room where I watch the footy. I never watch it with anyone, obviously can't at the moment uh, during lockdown, uh, but I like to just watch it by myself. I got up, like my wife said to me after the game, she said, whenever you play footy, I don't hear boo from you. And I, I'm sometimes screaming at umpires, whatever, but she doesn't hear me, whatever. She doesn't, the game's finished, she doesn't, know, whatever. I ran out of this room screaming. My kids are all asleep. i got three kids. They're all asleep. I, we won, we won. I go, we won. I was, I ran downstairs. I'm screaming. My wife thought I was, something was wrong with the kids or something. It was just scenes uh, at my place, um, <laughs> and I actually my uh, I spoiled the game for my father in law, who's not a Melbourne supporter, but he was watching it on a slight delay. <laughs> yeah. so, but uh, he's a Bulldogs fan, so uh, he's got his own issues. Um, <laughs> let's uh, let's talk uh, about the match first quarter. Mm-hmm. I thought we had the the first quarter on our terms in almost every aspect. With the exception of the scoreboard, the easy miss shots have been the bane of my football ex- existence this year. And the, the misses to Viney, which was, you know, he was in a similar position to where Max was at the end of the game. And Fritch again uh, proved costly. I thought we should have perhaps been at least a goal, maybe two up at the first break. So it's a bit disappointing. I mean, I mean you've got to take these chances. Uh, again, you know, this is like a finals-like game and, you know, finals opponents. Um, uh, you know, don't want to see us... Not kicking uh, truly and costing us, uh, George. Uh, first quarter. Yeah, that was exactly it, Andy. The um, uh, it was it, the first quarter was exactly what I thought would it be like. It, it was a game of one v two. Uh, it was always going to be hard contested. Each each opponent trying each other out. Um, young players making mistakes. Um, we saw Sparrow kick into the man oh, on the mark twice. twice. Oh. 
Um, we saw Smith spoil, spoiled Petty's marking attempt at one stage. Um, but what was interesting um, was, again, the, the criticality of, of taking your opportunities when they present themselves and the Viney miss and the Fritch miss, although that was probably from about 40 out, they're the ones that when you get to finals, when you get to grand finals, they will almost invariably come down to one or two points in the game where you get an opportunity to do something as a player and you have to take it. Um, so while we were leading by a couple, was it a couple of points at the end of the first quarter, it should have been a couple of goals. Um, hopefully, once again, we've been talking about this over the last couple of weeks, you've, the, the set shot kicking um, will either win you the game or lose it. And and um, in this this game, we were fortunate. We actually started to kick our set shots a lot better and uh, as the game progressed. And I think that was the na- probably the nature of a lot of the, the um, problems that we just needed to settle down a, a bit more in that first quarter. And I think that we'll see a lot more of that as the finals series progresses. So um, uh, Sparrow in particular, I thought, you know, even, even though he's a young kid and he didn't... And, he didn't know what to do when he'd taken those marks that he got and subsequently kicked into the man on the mark. He, he'll get the confidence to play on and exploit the opposition in those circumstances. He was just confusing himself. Um, uh, I think he was uh, put onto danger field um, later on in the quarter and basically held him. So that'll do a lot for his confidence. And when you've got players like him and the other seven players that we've got are under the age of 21 playing in this side, that sort of game really does wonderful things for them in terms of preparation for the finals. Uh, before you go, big man, uh, just on Sparrow, and I, a number of our players do it when they take a mark. That I don't feel they go back far enough over the mark. We've had quite a few players, you know, kick it into the man on mark. Tracks done it, Viney's done it, where they just they're too close to the man on the mark, and I know they're probably looking to get it on quickly and hey, maybe handballing it to someone running past. But it's happened a couple of times. It annoys me, but uh, yeah. Be man, just on the first quarter. Yeah, stuff. Have you, you got anything? You suddenly speeded up there, uh, um, Andy. I'm not sure what happened. Your uh, it's probably your, your audio, audio just went super quick. It's probably your audio <laughs> like, just catching up. You trying to get the ball on quickly? <laughs> yes, yeah, so it's um, probably your audio catching up some uh, compression thing or something. Um, yeah, I thought we had the better of the first quarter. Actually, it's interesting what you're saying, George, about you know them being sort of up in in at various areas. I, I thought that. I thought in the ruck they were, but it, it was interesting. Uh, you know, I, I actually think that in the first quarter and half, we were on top in most areas and we had the game how we wanted it. Um, I, I didn't realise this watching the game, but um, on first crack, Montagna pointed out something quite interesting is that we brought an extra to the stoppage and matched their extra um, at the stoppage in the first half, which was really interesting and in that... Um, if I remember correctly, I think we've only done that once previously. Um, and um, so that was an interesting tactical um, decision to make, um, presumably to sort of, you know, it's a very narrow, congested ground, um, you know, to, they're a good contested team. Um, and that, you know, that we, it was an interesting game in terms of that discussion about clearances because after 12 minutes, we got um, eight of the first 10 clearances. And, you know, it's hard not to think that a big factor in that was having the um, the equal number of players at the stoppage. Um, and so we had two, by that stage, Harms had two and Oliver had two. So, you know, we were killing him in the um, stoppages. Where they they're such a good kicking team, aren't they? They got so many good kicks, and after about twenty minutes, they were uh, of that first quarter, eighty four percent percent kicking efficiency to our sixty nine, and they were hundred percent kicking eff- efficiency inside um, fifty. And you'd be not surprised either of you to learn we were forty percent inside our forward fifty, and that again speaks to not taking advantage of that. You know, both the set shots but missed targets. Um, and the other interesting thing was that they really targeted um, Brown. They went to him, um, you know, almost exclusively. Um, he, you know, eight times they went to him in that first quarter. Um, so they, you know, that they, they really targeted it in on him. Um, we got a couple of our goals from stoppages, and they didn't get any. So it was really interesting tactically. They decided to um, sort of emphasise the stoppage for the first time this year, pretty much. 
Um, and we ended that quarter um, dominating the clearances um, 14 to 6 and winning the inside 50s 12 to 10. So we're, we were up on all the numbers that we wanted. We're up on contested ball at the end of the first quarter. Um, we were up in clearances, obviously, um, both in the centre clearances and around um, the ground. So the game you know, was on our terms the way we would have liked it coming into the second. Well, let's talk about what happened in the second quarter that uh, saw the start of uh, a nine unanswered goals that ultimately put us 44 points down at the 20-minute mark of the third quarter, a lead that at times seemed uh, that at the time uh, seemed insurmountable. Uh, Big man, you want to you'll be the man taking us uh, through what happened. Uh, what happened then? What? Uh, why? What, what was happening uh, to us that uh, allowed them to just keep scoring? I mean, again, I, I, I watched the replay um, and I watched it tonight before the show just to check because I, I knew I was going to talk about the second and the, the third quarter, is that the game was pretty level. We The numbers were fairly similar um, right up to about halfway through that quarter. They started getting, you know, the game on their terms a little bit. Um, and the thing that they like to do, as everyone knows by this stage of the um, Scott um, regime, is you know, control of possession and control the ball. Um, and we won the first quarter time in possession, interestingly, um, 42% to 41. But by halfway through that quarter, the 16-minute mark or so, they controlled, they started controlling that ball. Um, and they, you know, about that stage, that was 51% to 28% um, um, percent, uh, in control. And, and presumably it's the balls in contest for the rest of the time. So, you know, they really, they were dominating um, um, the sort of, not dominating, they're controlling the ball the way they like to in terms of holding possession. Um, I, I tend to think that that ground doesn't suit us because it, um, you'd think sort of, it's a bit counterintuitive. You'd think with our zone, we'd be hard to penetrate, which we, we proved to be the case in the last second half. They only scored two goals, three in the second half. But it negates our advantage, I think, because it brings, it's you know, that zone, everyone can clag it up. doesn't matter what team you are, you can create a zone down there. So it's just so narrow. So I, don't, I think it really didn't help us and it didn't help a player like, um, uh, uh, in particular, T-Mac. There's just no space to run into or even up the ground. Um, from about halfway through that quarter, it seemed like the sort of the momentum shifted slowly. Um, and, um, you know, there were a couple of really, I thought May had probably his, not his best half of footy. Um, two goals um, were given up. One, that um, Hawkins just sort of out-muscled him and really the second one too. Uh, he just out-muscled him. That first one was the 23-minute mark that they got. Um, Hawkins got his goal and was good enough to kick it from the boundary. So, um, you know, well played. But then after that, you know, from there was a goal at the 25-minute mark from Dangerfield. Immediately another goal um, out of the centre square for to close, 26-minute mark, and then another one um, uh, to Gary Rowan straight out of the centre. So they got three of their um, centre clearances, and that's what we've talked about all season. It's about not the number of centre clearances. We were well up in centre clearances at that point. It's the quality of them, um, and they were roll gold quality because they were able to get forward of the ball. And, and looking at them, two of them, um, on one of them, the one danger field kicked from 65, 70 metres. Uh, Harms made a, an error in the sense that he sort of sat off him and didn't charge him. But, you know, I guess the threat would have been if he charged him, he goes over the top and creates the hole. Uh, and danger field was good enough to kick it from close on 65 metres, I reckon. And then the second one, they also got out the front of the, the contest um, and Rivers slipped. I didn't realise um, until tonight when I watched it, Rivers slipped and he was coming off the halfback flank to, to stop um, the ball being moved out of the centre and he slipped and the sort of danger field again went straight up like parting the seas. So, you know, those it was a incredible run of goals. So the Hawkins goal was 23 minutes 55 and then the um, Gary Rowan goal, the fourth goal in that run was only five minutes later, less than five minutes at the 28 minute 12 second mark. So, you know, four goals in less than five minutes. That was incredible. Um, and then the icing on the cake for them was that, you know, hats off. That was an unbelievable goal from Cameron. Um, we did everything right. Gorn did everything right to hit it back towards and get a point. Um, his ability to catch that ball and put it on his boot um, was phenomenal. So really was a super impressive berth. I think that, you know, what happened, that happens in footy 
it has, you know, it happens to us every other year. It hasn't happened this year. Um, and it really shows the sort of 666, as you're saying, Andy, doesn't it? Because you can't set up your zone. For three of those goals, we've got no chance to set up the zone. Um, we were we were playing quite aggressive. We were looking to win the clean, you know, um, centre clearances. And with that take is some risk. If you're set up aggressively to win clearances and happen to lose them and your half-back flankers don't come in and um, create a contest, then you're in a bit of trouble. And that's exactly what happened. Um, and so, you know, they, they definitely got on top. I think the big factor um, in that period, but um, uh, what's his name? Oliver had dominated up to that point, but didn't get a kick in the last 10 minutes of that third quarter. I thought that was a, a big factor. Uh, and, and I don't think May didn't have a um, good game on Hawkins and um, he had a good second half, but not till then. Um, and the other factor I thought was um, a little bit, sort of an issue is that I thought Stanley did a good job on Gorn and, um, you know, we clearly were a bit muddled in that, you know, to give up those sort of three clean um, inside 50s was um, obviously less than ideal. So it was a crazy um, few minutes of footy. And then for me in the third quarter, um, you know, again, the game was back on level terms. In fact, I thought we had better of the, um, you know, we, we brought the ball back. Montagna said, uh, again, I didn't realise this, Montagna said we uh, abandoned the uh, extra at the contest, so we put our Salem back behind the ball and we started getting intercept marks. Lever started getting his intercept marks. Um, and, you know, they, that first goal they got was a slightly against the run of play. Um, as I said, you know, went all the way through. I thought it was at least level pegging up until, you know, the seven-minute marks. The crucial part for me of the whole game was those two goals we got to bring it back to 32 points. Uh, they, were, they were critical. But, yeah, it was a crazy four or five minutes of footy. Um, and, you know, I, I think it really held the club in good stead that they were able to even psychologically rebound from that um, because, you know, a, a lot of teams uh, would, you know, pack up stumps after that. And it gives them a lot of belief that uh, they can be 44 points down midway through, or more than midway through a game, uh, almost uh, three quarters of the way through a game and and come back. And you're not always going to be able to do that belief. Now there's the belief that they've done it before, they can do it again as long as they uh, can right the ship. Uh, George, you want to add anything to that or go on to how we uh, wrestle control back? I think there's a couple of things and it's even more critical than what, in man's just outlined. Um, we were 10 points down with six minutes of playing time left in that second quarter. And 10 points was not unexpected. Geelong had kicked three goals, I think, up to that point because uh, we were eight points up at the start of the early on in the in, in the quarter. So, But that's, that's to be expected between two top-of-the-table sides. It was a good battle up to that stage. With six minutes to go, we were 10 points um, behind very achievable, quite quite acceptable. They actually scored four goals in the next minute and 40 seconds. And the, and the change that occurred was when Viney went off the ground and Harms came on. He, he immediately went to uh, Parfit, lost him, and then there was the three goals in the middle that came out. Again, two of them directly to his man that he lost and a third one where he either fell over or was bumped nicely by Selwood, um, where his opponent was was let clear. So after that mere two minutes on the ground, they took Harms out of the middle and put Viney back in, and immediately we got the first cl- uh, got a clearance to stop the rot at that particular stage. But um, I've spoken about this before. I don't think we can afford to leave Harms in the middle on a one-on-one situation with quality players that we'll run into in final series. He's very good around the ground in the contested scrambling just get the ball forward situations, but when he's got to hold someone or think where he's got to go, he really struggles. Um, yeah, so what was 10 points with um, six minutes to go to uh, turned into 34 points, like I said, one minute and 40 seconds later. Um, the other problem was that I think, and I'm uh, because we'll never know, know this, I think Max was either carrying a corky or something. Stanley yeah. was absolutely out jumping him. It, was, it, it wasn't Max, firstly, Max wasn't jumping, which I suspect, um, you know, is usually associated with a corky that you can't actually put any power through your legs. But Max wasn't jumping and Stanley was getting clean hit outs during that. Yeah. Um, and uh, running running away with the ball at times. Uh, yeah, too. yeah. Um, Max just couldn't do anything. Max, at that stage, couldn't, couldn't mark properly. He was 
couldn't get any elevation. And so they were getting the double effect of a, a really dominant ruckman at that period of time. Um, and then, like I said, we we're almost running one down until Viney got back in the middle and around the packs. Um, so, yeah. Um, and just on George, just on um, Max in that clip where um, uh, Dangerfield kicks that goal where he sort of big space opened up in front of him and he ran yeah. into it and was good enough yep. to, to yep. kick it. Gorn was unable, he looked like he wasn't making an effort, but of course yeah. he would explain it because he sort of turned to the channel, to the centre of the ground and really didn't put, yeah, um, put any in. pressure on yeah. him, um, which is completely unlike Maxi. Like there's yeah. not, you know, he's not a player who doesn't do it. So that, you know, I think that's probably a good get actually. I didn't, yeah. I didn't consider that because, um, yeah, that's really, and that just opened up in combining with Harms not coming at um, Dangerfield. Suddenly he had acres of space yeah. uh, at that point. The other, the other thing though in that patch is that um, Selwood of all players gets a holding um, against Oliver and Oliver's scrag yeah. with the whole match. Maybe it was there, maybe it wasn't. Then the second one, the clearance, was a complete and utter throw from Selwood out um, the back of the contest. Um, he threw at least three, four times, but that that was a complete and utter throw as well. Um, yeah, they, that, that's right. They had that space. They were a little bit sort of all, all over the shop. <laughs> it's interesting, um, Andy, the comment that you said was in the um, Player of the Year thread about you wonder if Andy Bimman and George are going to give Harms a credit in his third time. I'm guessing maybe, maybe not this week. <laughs> well, I, I I didn't think besides uh, the, those points. I thought Harms, as George said, around the ground did a few nice things. Yeah. Um, and, and I don't think we've not given Harms credit when he's played well uh, this year. Um, and we're going to talk about Harms later, but we may as well talk about it now. So we, we had a poster in the, I'll, I'll mention, in the Demonland Player of the Year thread. He seemingly was calling us out in regards to James Harms. It was Demonland poster Damon uh, said, I wonder if Andy, Bim and George are going to give Harms the credit he deserves. And I replied, look, I thought he was good last night. My main problem with Harms is his inconsistency from week to week. He's played some great games this year and some not so great games this year. And I think that's my problem with him. He's been inconsistent. Consistent, and um, I, I haven't watched the second quarter again. Um, I haven't been able to bring myself to, to watch it yet. I've watched the rest of it, pretty much. Uh, but George, you point uh, that the Harms's efforts uh, in the, that period, and uh, yeah, it doesn't paint a, a great picture. Um, but I'm not adverse to having him in other positions around uh, the ground. Um, yeah, yeah, no, exactly. Look, like I said, around the ground, I think he's he's fantastic. You need that grunt sort of play, you know, to be able to keep on going. He's got the right sort of body now. I think just in, particularly in the middle, he gets exposed because he's just one-on-one with only, you know, three other opponents, uh, sorry, you know, the usual, with the, with the centre square scenario, only three other players around him. There's plenty of room to manoeuvre and he, he just loses players um, that's too easy in there. But once once you've got ten players around the ball, or um, he, he's much more valuable. So um, he'll be in the side next week, no doubt. But yeah, like yeah, I said, the the, the, co- the coach has removed him after two minutes, and I think I think the coaches know exactly what's going on. Um, he only came back once into the centre square bounce, uh, once one more time for the rest of the game that I saw. So um, the other th- the other interesting thing I think that. Um, just on the max scenario is that it didn't happen until uh, probably five minutes into the third quarter, but they threw Jackson onto Stanley. And Jackson is far more athletic than what Max was capable of doing at that particular point in the game. And Jackson started to nullify him, um, which I think was critical. Um, Although we didn't um, claw everything back um, in the third quarter, I think that was important in terms of turning the game around. Jackson just stopped him, and um, then Max had time to recover. I think uh, that's the key, get time to, to recover. And yeah. he also dropped back a bit in that quarter as well. Back yeah. In that and- yeah, so um, again, don't underestimate, people shouldn't underestimate the value of Jackson in, in that particular scenario. You know, he, he re- really... You just don't see numbers um, to favour Jackson, but Stanley was completely and utterly dominant during that period of time, and all of a sudden he stopped providing um, the the drive out of the centre in particular that they'd enjoyed in that second and early in the third quarter. 
Right, before we go on to talk about um, uh, the, th- the end of the third into the fourth, we do have a caller on the line. Uh, good evening. You are on the air. Who am I talking to? Oh, well, hold on. Right, one, sec, one sec, caller. Uh, sorry, you are on the air. Who are you talking to? Hello. I'd have to call back. Um, I hadn't had it uh, connected properly. Let me just check it's all in there. Yep. Uh, caller, if you you are listening, uh, give us a call back. Uh, I've got it all plugged in right now. So, um, yeah, give us a call back uh, when you can. Uh, George, do you want to start? I uh, know oh, no, we've got the caller here now. Uh, sorry about that, caller. You're on the air now. Or maybe not. Don't know why we're not getting audio. Um, caller, you're going to have to call back later. Sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, let's let's go on. I'm not sure why it's uh, it isn't working. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, George, uh, you want to talk? You know what turned it all around for the D's? You know we kicked eight goals of the eight the last eight goals of the match, culminating in Max uh, Max's goal after the siren. You want to take us through that? Um, this was one of the most remarkable turnarounds from individual efforts um, I think that I've ever seen. Ma- like I said, uh, Max looked completely out to me. Um, he'd barely taken a mark around the ground. Um, he was struggling in the ruck in a big, big way. And whatever happened to three-quarter time, he came out and um, you talk about captain's game. Well, he provided that captain's game. Well, suddenly we got the first clearance out. We had the first couple of goals on in un- under two minutes. Um, Oliver was just superb, both in the middle and and up in the forward line with a couple of goals in the uh, at, in the at that stage um, to really bring us in. Um, all of a sudden, Charlie Spargo pops up, having done nothing you know, effectively earlier on in the game. We were just getting the ball in there um, and putting putting them under pressure. And the other thing I think that happened, um, and this will be the great unknown, is something happened to Dangerfield. Um, he was off the ground for a long, long period of time. And post-match, um, Oliver, when Max was kicking for the goal, Oliver was chatting to him about a calf injury of some sort. What what that meant, I don't know. But um, we've spoken about it previously that uh, we'd basically levelled the scores with... 10 or 15 minutes to go in the quarter and your best player up to that stage is off the ground um, and was off the ground for probably 8 to 10 minutes. Selwood was there for similar sorts of periods of time. Um, either they'd run completely run out of steam or there was something else going on. So we took full advantage of that. Um, we were just unstoppable. It was just quite amazing. And, and we'll talk about the... Um, the final minute or two a bit later on, you know, it was just a, a remarkable sort of finish. But um, the, the individual turnarounds that were were just just amazing to watch, you know, from where these players had been, you know, not 10 minutes or 15 minutes before. So, um, yeah, again, just gives great confidence to the rest of the side when you, when you know you can be so far down and so far out of the game and all of a sudden turn it around and, and finish up winning it. Uh, B man, uh, anything you want to add? Yeah, just, uh, the first goal of that quarter was um, Hawkins at the eight minute mark, approximately, and up and we hadn't scored a goal um, since the second minute um, of the second term. So we've gone almost a full, you know, quarter and a bit of scoring. And um, in that period, we went inside 50, 21 times for no goals. Um, and they'd gone inside, um, nine, they'd kicked nine goals from um, 19 entries in that same period. So you know, that's incredible, isn't it? Almost 50% goals, not scoring. Um, sort of 20 entries in the, you know, and 12, 21, we um, um, didn't score. And that, that was a lot to do with our, you know, inside kick and the way we were kicking and the sort of how crowded it is down there at Geelong. That's an incredible stat, I thought. And, um, you know, to turn it around from there um, was incredible, I thought, in terms of just to get it back on our terms. Um, but that's a long time without a goal, isn't it? So, the, um, you know, I think, George, Andy, I, I can't recall 
hard to recall a better game by an individual player than Oliver. He was brilliant right through that game. As I said, the period of the um, the 10 minutes of the last second quarter, he didn't get a touch, so that was a big factor, obviously. Um, but he was phenomenal right through the game. Um, I thought it was in some ways a more meritorious victory because Tom McDonald basically did nothing, a couple of good tackles and um, brought the ball down a couple of times. But um, if it had been Wiedemann, we'd probably be jumping up and down on him, but he's got some credit in the bank. Um, and as I said, the, the ground doesn't suit him. Um, and Gorn was clearly struggling. You're right. I thought Stanley had the better of him, but I cannot recall a better final quarter from any Melbourne player, Robbie Flower included, in that last quarter. That was just incredible. And obviously to seal it the way he did was just the icing on the cake, but he was phenomenal. He just dragged us into that match and refused to to die. The thing about um, Dangerfield was interesting. He was off the ground for seven minutes. So was Selwood and Selwood but copped that head knock. And so I wonder whether he was off with, you know, they're worried, but it felt a little bit to me in, in a funny way, similar to the West Coast game uh, in the sense that, you know, up until the lightning break, um, you know, we were on top. When we came out, as we talked about after that game, is that the momentum, you know, we just weren't going in with the same ferocity and they were. And for me, it felt a little bit like that, is that they had come out and maybe in their mind they were sort of joking at the three-quarter time and, you know, the commentators were driving me nuts about um, Hawkins getting his eight goals to win the, the Coleman. You know, it just felt like a procession and, you know, it's as if Geelong were hearing that. Um, I, I feel very strongly that they had a sort of mentally put their cue in the rack a bit um, and thought, well, you know, we're not going to lose this game. So we're not going to throw everything at it. Um, and, you know, including resting a danger field. Um, I, mean, I know the ball can get trapped on the other side and it's hard to get them off, but he didn't get a possession in the last quarter. So, mm-hmm. you know, Gorn dominated the best quarter of footy I can recall from any Melbourne player. And um, and Dangerfield, who's their star player, their best player, big time player, doesn't get a possession. I don't think Hawkins got much in that last quarter, and I don't think Selwood did. So their three most senior players really did bugger all in a must win in the last quarter of an absolute must win game. And and what was remarkable, none of them could conjure up a um, um, a sort of clutch goal when they needed it. So they really the one that the big miss was the one where uh, Cameron hit the post. No, you know, he had to kick around his body, but he'd, he'd get that seven out of 10 times. He's a brilliant kick. Um, but they just needed the one goal. It's just, it's sort of funny to see a game like that when the intensity levels go two ways. And apparently you know, on that pressure rating, I, I read or heard that we were up, you know, in that last quarter up above 190 and we hadn't been for the whole match. So, you know, using that analogy I used last week about upping the, you know, upping the rating in rowing, well, we we got our rating as fast as we could. Uh, and, you know, they it was a bit like they couldn't go with us. And by the time they realised they had to, they couldn't get, they couldn't get their stroke going. So, um, yeah, it was a phenomenal last quarter. Uh, and the other thing is that they couldn't get the game the way they wanted it. So they couldn't control the tempo. It was they were desperately trying to slow the ball movement down to chip it across the back um, half to just hold it for a while. And we just refused to let them have any peace and we're up in their grill. And, um, you know, that's why I really, you know, think that that game style that they employ gets them top four every year, no worries. But it, it is not a system that's going to win um, flags consistently because it relies too much on um, controlling the ball. And, you know, when teams are manic uh, and they're swarming, it's it's really difficult to, you know, to um, maintain possession under those circumstances. Had myself on mute. Sorry, guys. Um, uh, well, let's uh, talk some uh, individual efforts. Uh, as mentioned, uh, Clayton Oliver just superb. Thirty-seven possessions, twenty-seven con- contested, nine clearances, eight score involvements, seven tackles, seven intercepts, and, and two very good and timely goals. Uh, We've been screaming for Clary to hit the scoreboard in matches uh, to turn him from a weapon into a nuclear weapon, uh, uh, and he was just immense. And it's no coincidence that, uh, as you mentioned, then we were in the midst of those nine unanswered goals. I don't believe he he touched it uh, in that time, uh, if the commentators uh, were to be believed. Um, uh, do you think he's a he's a chance for for the Brownlow uh, guys, uh, George? I might start with you. I, I think there's a very good chance of it, particularly after this game. Um, I suspect the only real challenge is um, probably Ollie Wines um, 
uh, port and, and um, votes vote stealing from his partner vote, in crime. Stealing, yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, look, you never know with um, uh, the brown low simply because it's voted on by umpires. We know how good they are, but um, and we'll talk about them a bit later on. Um, but yeah, that that was just simply a brilliant brilliant game from Oliver. You know, um, Bin Man said it. The Gorn game was as good as he's ever seen. Well, uh, I think the Oliver game was was only marginally below that, if if that at all. And uh, no, the uh, Gorn last quarter, uh, yeah, last really quarter. Right. But I, he was quite yeah. quiet for the rest of the game. Yeah, but certainly that Oliver last quarter was just as just as uh, critical. And when you got two players like that complementing each other, you know, they they both dragged us into that game. Uh, yeah, it was. Yeah, the superlatives are, are insufficient for for what we saw in that game. I heard someone talk about would you tag him, and they were like, "Well, no, he can't. He's not taggable. Yeah. Uh, what, what do you do? You, he's got such quick hands, and you're spot on, Andy. The um, you know the kicking goals takes him to the next level. But we saw why we don't win that game if he doesn't kick those two goals. And the first one was super clever because Danger Winge was whinging on the ground about the free kick and he was really alert to the opportunity to play on um, and get inside 50. He would have been kicking... For, he wouldn't have been able to get the distance. He would have been kicking from outside 50. Danger Field was on the 50-metre line where the free would have been given. Super clever to, to uh, run forward of the ball. Uh, so he run forward of it and kick that goal. And then his snap was um, just really brilliant after Spargo had not given it to him previously uh, in that play. And it was just so timely. He, you know, essentially between him and, you know, we don't win the game without either of those two players playing. Uh, he, he was phenomenal. Um, and I, we've talked about it, not for a while, but in the beginning of the season, how much more... Um, forward he gets with his kicking he's just you know I don't know what the numbers are Andy but he's he's probably it feels like it's 50 50 now he's kicking to the handball ratio whereas it was always 70 30 in previous years and uh, he's really getting great depth on his kicking and you know when in doubt he, he really gets it up the ground and um geez you wouldn't want to come between him and the footy though would you certainly not um I did see someone posted on Twitter um, during the week of what his uh, his kick to handball ratio was this week, and it was was a lot closer uh, than it used to be. Certainly, um, I probably won't be able to find it in a timely manner, um, and no, I won't. So, oh, here we go: uh, seventeen kicks, twenty handballs, so almost fifty fifty this week, and yeah. it used to be a lot, a lot, uh, a lot different. So we've had uh, our caller call back a couple of times. I just, for some reason, I just can't seem to get uh, the audio. To come through, I, d- I don't know why. Um, I'm going to just try this one thing. Can you hear that, guys? I can hear you saying, please record a message. Yeah, that wasn't me. That was the thing. But it's really soft. I don't know what, what's going on there. Um, anyway, if caller, if you want to uh, give a call back, we'll, 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 try one more, <laughs> we'll try one more time. Uh, but I apologise if we can't get you on. Uh, Max, we've spoken pretty much spoken about Max. Uh, the only thing I wanted just to ask you, uh, B-Man, you were talking about a potential corky. How do you reconcile that with uh, his last quarter? Uh, if he was carrying something earlier in the game, he's certainly shrugged it off and whatever whatever magic spray that they've used um, uh, probably could cure COVID. So, <laughs> um, yeah, how, how do you reconcile his last quarter with uh, your comments that you thought he might have been injured earlier on? Well, I, I think sort of um, George has probably hit the nail on the head is that, um, well, one, he had the halftime break. So let's say it was a corky and he was inconvenienced um, at some point. You know, the amount of wax he gets is it wouldn't um, shock me. He's got the halftime break. Uh, and as George said, they ran, um, they, uh, Jackson had a lot more time in the ruck um, in that third quarter. So maybe that was enough. And I think that really the, the sort of the other part of the answer is just his willpower. Like he just willed himself into that game. And, you know, I, 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 there were some doubts about his captaincy, wasn't there? Sort of he wasn't universally thought, you know, there was the query about whether he is too much of a jokester and, you know, will he be able to, you know, 
has he got it in him to be a captain this year and last year, to be honest, but particularly this year, has put any doubts about that to bed completely. Um, I just think he just completely willed himself um, and refused to let the team lose. And geez, what more do you want from a, a captain? Um, even getting into position for that last play showed such good discipline um, for that last shot on goal. Um, and then, the, you know, to kick it through straight were, was enormous. But, yeah, I just think psychologically he he really showed true grit. I've got a, a friend who's um, a huge Cats fan. And ever since that 2000, was it 2018 or was when he missed that goal, he's been bagging Max Gorn saying that he's not a leader's um, bootstrap. Um, and it just drives me nuts because I say, hey, look, mate, you don't watch enough demons um, games, but that's just rubbish. You know? <laughs> um, and so it was just brilliant to see that last quarter and then the irony for him to kick the goal, it was just the ultimate captain's quarter, um, just mental fortitude and, you know, will to win. Um, Jay Cleaver is the um, intercept king. Uh, we've put to bed the debate about the draft picks given up for him, uh, so let us never speak of it again. Uh, some of those intercept marks are just, were just uh, truly match-saving. Uh, 12 intercepts, 7 intercept marks, 5 spoils, 22 of his own disposals. He's a be- that beautiful kick into position at the top of the square that m- when Max marked truly, uh, uh, and he... Could have had the mind, you know, he had the mind to kick it the way he did rather than attempt a, a long shot on goal. So, um, yeah, credit to him for that. Um, George? Yeah, nothing much more to add there, Andy. Um, I don't think we can put to bed the uh, the draft picks uh, scenario because there was every, every single piece of value that, that those draft picks might have otherwise uh, given us. Um, we've certainly got it in Jake Lever. Um, and then when you combine it with Stephen May, who... Uh, Demon Land uh, listeners might have seen on the uh, club website in an interview today. It was just fantastic to watch those pair, that pair um, operating together. And boy, what I was really impressed about uh, that interview was how just how good Lever is at speaking publicly. He's he's just a natural leader, and you just want to listen to him. But uh, on the ground, he was superb. Uh, like like I said, those were match saving. Um, intercept marks that he was taking um, particularly in the late, latter stages of the game um, and and I think um, we when May was out um, a couple of weeks ago um, I think we really missed uh, the lever that we saw in this game um, because May plays a general type role and and lever when he's let loose is is absolutely lethal and but also very critical to the way that we set up behind the ball um, and the way that he brings other players in. But um, yeah, that kick kick into Max was was absolutely superb as well. Beautifully weighted, put exactly into the right position. Geelong must. Uh, uh, from that perspective, be really critical of themselves. Um, if Max hadn't marked that ball, Harms was standing alongside him as well. And if you watch the replay, you'll see that Rivers had slid in behind him. If it went over Max's head, Rivers was going to mark it on his chest. Um, there were no, there were no Geelong players within striking range of where that ball went. And for Lever to able to be able to recognise that and drop it in exactly the right spot was was fantastic. So, um, yeah, big credits to Jake Lever out of that, this game. A couple of things about Jakey Lever's game. The, the first one, I, I was thinking that Smith might come in um, and play Hunt's role, um, and he did come in, but not to play Hunt's role. It was really to, to play a third tall, classic third tall role, and he spent a bit of time on... Um, Rowan, he spent a bit of time on Dangerfield, actually. He also had, um, um, I'm sure he got Cameron at one point um, as well. It was an important role because um, it allowed Lever to, to play his intercept role and meant that he didn't have to go one-on-one, um, which was really important. The other interesting thing is that the point that Montagna makes about um, us bringing an extra to the stoppage or to levelling up, it's probably a better way of thinking of it in the first half because we were winning more clearances and that takes away the intercept. When when they drop the, the player away from that contest, they started winning clearances, which brings Jake Lever into the game because they're obviously winning clearances and kicking into their forward line. That brought him into the game. And so I'd actually don't know what the split for his um, intercept marking um, 
ended up being, but I'm guessing that he had more intercept marks in the second half. He was certainly more influential in the second half. Um, he's got bigger and stronger across his chest, it seems, and his marking technique seems to have improved. I don't know, maybe he's always been a sort of technically good mark, but he's got such good hands, hasn't he? And uh, mm. um, he makes really, really good decisions. And as you say, George, the decision he made at the end was was a brilliant bit of sort of both team work, but also thinking through him. And I heard Oliver say, uh, maybe it was track, I can't remember, one of them laughing that, oh, you know, they... Um, uh, Oliver, a track said to him to kick it, or Oliver said to him to kick it. He said he didn't have it in him. There's no way he was going to be able to kick 55 metres. And I think the Geelong players assumed he was going to go for it. Um, just that's where, you know, they all went back to the goal line and no one thought to man up the tallest player on the on the field. Well, they knew that there wasn't much time to go as in yeah, seconds so did to he, go. He yeah. turned to the boundary line and checked as he, at the, as he was running up the ground with the ball after the 50 metres um, had been paid. Lever turned to the bench and one presumes was told you've got 21 seconds. Geelong probably would have all been thinking that's, you know, they would have heard you've got 20 seconds, 20 seconds before that, thinking, well, he's going to have to kick. He doesn't have the, mm. you know, he doesn't have time not to go for, for the goal. Yeah, thank God he did. Um, uh, they mentioned earlier on in the game that uh, Dalhouse was sort of uh, manning him as as clubs have sort of been doing, trying to, to negate uh, he's just a third man up, sort of roaming around freely. Um, so perhaps that's maybe why he was quieter then and as the game sort of went on and <laughs> people get a bit looser, he was able to sort of play his natural role. Um, I just also wanted to mention Cozzy and Spargo. Uh, you have small forwards in the team to rove the pack, packs and create those scoring opportunities, hit the scoreboard. Both have done this, contributed to us winning the match, five goals between them, um, the those two goals uh, from Spargs were great. He was also involved in in one of our other, I think, with um, uh, maybe when Oliver got his the goal. Yep. Um, yep. But Viney, was he, did he handball out to Viney? I can't remember uh, when Viney got it in that third, the, the check side. Um, I'm not sure. Was it the second? Right? In the second, yeah, the first of the second. He might have been involved there. Yeah, just wanted to uh, big thumbs up uh, for them. Um, we've spoken about James Harms, uh, T Mac. Uh, we sort of alluded to that. He was overly impressed with his game. He's been sidelined with the back complaint for two weeks, so there might have been something in there, or maybe just needs some time to find form. And you know, but now's that now's the time. We're not mucking around. It's finals. Um, you know, thank thank Evans for for Ben Brown because in the past, if it was just T Mac and he's had an off night like that, we would have been in serious trouble trying to find uh, avenues to goal. Um, uh, but Ben Brown, the t- the two goals uh, from him, that came, is a handy addition to the side. There's no doubt about that. Um, and shows that doesn't he show the benefit of exactly what we've been talking about at Infinitum of the benefit of kicking straight. Um, I, I think T Mac he does a lot of blocking, a lot of sort of he was they were going to Brown a lot. That ground doesn't suit um, those tall players. I mean, none of their tools really. I mean, Hawkins is not really at all, I mean, he is, but he relies on his strength and his wrestling and um, they go to him a lot. Um, they go to him as much as we do to Brown almost. Um, but Rowan was pretty quiet, wasn't he? Sort of he's an equivalent player. I think that it's so narrow that, you know, someone like Tom McDonald's one wood is running up the ground into space and, you know, all, all you can do at Cadinia Park is on a tram track run. You know, if you run, there's no space to have those long leads into. Um, there's players everywhere. Um, just doesn't doesn't suit him. So I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't sort of even knock him on that performance. I think those tours are going to have those sorts of games. It was, um, yeah, you were right about the ground. There's, uh, we didn't see the linking role from either T Mac or from Brown in this particular game. A lot of it just comes back to. Um, uh, kicking it to the top of the goal square and because it compresses so quickly um, with the shape of the ground that yeah. and, and Geelong have got some tall people in there like uh, Henry you know, the, once it just comes to a, one tall on another tall it, it, no, nobody wins out of that sort of thing and uh, when you've got players like T-Mac and, and Brown who are dependent on getting a run at the ball for a start to take advantage of their height yeah. um, they're just not, not going to see it. I think the other exactly. problem was that um, particularly in that um, it was probably in the third quarter more than more than uh, anything else. It was almost like a dew came down on the ground as well. 
um, there was a lot of fumbling going on for both sides. And I think that really affected us in a big way. And, and again, when you've got players like the Browns and, and uh, McDonald's trying to mark the ball um, with a slippery, greasy ball, it, it, it really takes away from their game. But, yeah, he'll be back next week and better for it. Yeah, on the open spaces of Adelaide Oval running up, that you know, the, no worries at all. Yeah. I mean, one thing, I, just a comment about that ground is that the Scott under the, had an amazing record uh, under Scott. They've won the one flag. Um, if you're a Cats fan, you probably would want more from this list, I guess. But mm. you know, they finished top four pretty much every year, haven't they? Under his uh, under coaching, maybe one he missed out. Um, you know, and so obviously they do a lot right as a footy club. They've got brilliant kicking um, side. They're a fantastic sort of skilled side. They've recruited well, all of that stuff. One thing I will say, though, is that that ground gives them such a huge advantage in the home and away season in terms of, you know, I heard um, Hamish uh, McLaughlin or, uh, saying they'd won 90% of their games here. I'm not sure of the time frame. That is, but there I must reckon. have been a time frame because I looked up that stat uh, for my intro and it's they've only won like 66% of games there since um, yeah, since they've started playing there in the 40s. Typical inaccurate. So I immediately well, it might have been since said, 95 or something. In the last 10 years or something. Yeah, Nonetheless, have, they've yeah. got a massive advantage down there and, you know, they, they've structured a game plan that suits that, um, mm. that the way that um, field is. And I was trying to think, is there another team in the AFL who gets to train on the ground, their home ground, that they play on? I'd say West Coast probably train a bit on their ground. I'm sure they have another training ground, but they'd, they'd get time. Them and Freo, you'd think it would get office. time. Would they get to train on Optus? I'll bet you they don't. Uh, well, I, I don't know. I don't know, I I don't know just for assume. sure, but I was trying to think. Through, right? you know, so that's a huge leg up, isn't it, mm, to be able yeah. to, to – it's such a weird ground, so peculiar. It sets up for their whole defensive rebounding stuff. It's no wonder it's hard to score against it down there, you know, because it's so congested, and they get to train on it. Yeah. Yeah. The other, the other player who would have been and was severely affected by, by the shape of the ground was Fritsch who depends on sort of getting out the back and having uh, room to manoeuvre sort of thing. Um, yeah. Uh, but in this case, again, because it just compresses so quickly towards the goals, there's just no no room to get out the back. Um, you know, he was lucky in the one goal that he did where he's outbodied someone. But normally Fritsch is taking marks out in front, and, but no room to go in this, but, yeah. in this game. Also, the way that we kick into the forward line, how we go to the boundary side if it's a narrower ground it's going to be less room to sort of run into as you're kicking there so yeah yeah sort of well let's hope we don't have to play there again which looks like we won't have to play there again this year so that's a good thing uh i didn't mention i didn't have this guy down in my notes or the show notes for you but i just say isn't it great to see langdon more involved in games has been quite a period where uh, the teams have been avoiding the so that side of the ground or 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 so Langdon's been a bit quieter uh, last week. He was sort of back to it. We acknowledge that, but it was good to sort of see see the ball on his side of the ground a lot more. Um, but, and how quick is he now? Like yeah. he's running over the ground quick. Um, he's a, you know when he's on, he's a seriously quick player. He you know he doesn't get taken down from behind. The other player is quick and looks super fit at the moment. Is Cozzy? I mean, obviously, it's sort of. No surprise that he's fast. But after he kicked that first goal, you know, he was sort of slowing down afterwards, running back. Um, and he, you know, he's just an absolute sort of super um, athlete. Um, uh, uh, George, you wanted to talk about the coaches. Uh yeah, I think it's it's uh, it's easy to, to remember all the great players and the performances and things like that. But you know, this team was 44 points down in the third quarter. And the changes that were made, even with moving the right players into the right positions and the way that um, we set up um, around the ground and things like that, you've got to give some credit to the coaches. Um, I, th- I can't remember which interview it was on the club site uh, where they said um, Uze came and talked to them about about what needed to be changed at half halftime. Um, all these little things that... that um, we saw ch- slowly change in that in that third quarter, and eventually the dam wall broke in the in the last. That was all implemented by the coaching staff. You know, the the players might have lifted individually, and and we we as supporters just see the evidence on the screen in front of us. But um, yeah, there's a lot of work goes into the background about having the right setups and the right positioning, and um, 
uh, I think it's about time we probably scrubbed that is Goodwin the right man thread on Demon Land because uh, at the moment when you've got 17 wins and a draw in a season, uh, there's only one answer to that. <laughs> That's George. That's why I'd never be a mod. I would have deleted that <laughs> two years ago. So, yeah, make an executive. If we win the flag, can we, like, do a sort of virtual burning of that thread? Well, you know what will happen. Uh, you win the flag and then uh, come the Marsh series, as we've said, people will be complaining yeah. that we lost to Fremantle in Frio yeah, <laughs> and say yeah, we've got I, a grand final hangover. I think that's a good point about the coaching and afterwards, I mean, obviously they're all thrilled, but like they, I don't know if you saw either of you, but um, they swamped um, Williams. The players just swamped Williams. And so, you know, there's a lot of really good energy amongst the coaching crew and the, um, um, you know, also the the team and the, you know, but not just Goodwin, all of them. Um, I heard Max give um, Stafford a shout out a couple of times about, you know, focusing on his routine. That's what he was in his head when he went for that shot. So, um, yeah, there's a there's some really interesting moves. And I thought, you know, that, again, that tactical move of changing the stoppage is an interesting time to do that. Um, there were other couple of tactical tweaks I thought that were interesting is that we're mixing up um, going, we're going to the hotspot a bit more often, but uh, it's something we've been doing all season um, that we're doing um, a lot more of now, and we did heaps on Saturday night, is kicking the ball really, really high. I don't know if you've noticed that, you guys, but um, we often, particularly Langdon and others, and um, under pressure, if there's not a go-to player up the line, they kick long but really high. Um, and to give every... It's almost like rugby, giving everyone to you know, a chance to get back underneath it, and then we back ourselves to... They're pretty hard to mark when they're like that, but to bring it to ground, it was really, really noticeable. The other thing, too, just on a sort of tactical front that I've noticed is the discipline of the players to stand when they're asked to stand, to stand inboard and on an angle to make it really difficult to kick um, for players to kick into the corridor and get them to kick down the um, the wing, uh, sorry, down the boundary side of that mark um, and having that player on the 45. That's just really good discipline. And, um, you know, it was amazing speaking of that Goodwin thread, Darcy, who I cannot stand, but his comment was spot on. He said, Melbourne is such a well-coached team. I thought it'd be great to sort of bottle that and put that on that thread. Um, umpiring. I praised the umpires last week, uh, but I was back to cursing them again this week. I, I thought the game was just not adjudicated fairly and evenly, uh, and this is without a feral home crowd to egg them on. Uh, the free kick ledger of uh, 23 to 7 team was uh, even flattering uh, be- to them because it never takes into account the free kicks not paid. and. You mentioned a couple, I think, big man before. Uh, Selwood uh, just gets an armchair ride. I'm not even referencing, uh, referring to his pension for ducking. Uh, he received five free kicks for the match uh, and doesn't take into account the throws that uh, aren't uh, seen or ignored. Uh, you simply cannot touch him. And for, 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 some of the, for some of the frees for the life of me, I could not work out what the free kicks were for. Um, you know, there was one time he was on the ground. Petrarca was uh, tackled him. And the umpire said, holding the man. The guy had the ball in his hand or had just been just released. It's how can it be holding the man? It just, we just don't get afforded that same luxury. And uh, uh, yes, uh, that annoyed me. Now, this new 2021 flavour of the year free kick uh, when it comes to insufficient intent. For the life of me, I cannot work out how Clayton Oliver was awarded a free against him when he was bulldozed into his back and then into the ground whilst kicking it and the ball goes out, it was called insufficient intent. Um, first of all, it probably could have been a free kick to him, but I'll, I'll give up on that uh, if, if only it's not a free kick against him for that insufficient intent when Langdon was right there at the boundary line where the ball went out. Uh, and you know, clearly the tackle has caused the ball to deviate, not to mention errant kicking. Errant kicking should be taken into account when you're adjudicating someone's intent. You know, I understand there are times when players clearly go the boundary and have no intention of keeping it in, but uh, just crazy. Uh, same thing happened in a tackle in the last quarter against the Cats in, in our Ford 50 that wasn't paid uh, 
paid insufficient intent. Then later, Selwood makes no attempt to keep the ball in, and it's just ball it in. And then in the dying minutes, Gus, who's desperately trying to get the ball forward and keep it in, he's paid a free for insufficient intent, which is just ludicrous. Given the circumstances of the game, I assume that one of the reasons for the insufficient intent rule is to stop time wasting. But why would you want to waste time in that situation? Uh, I just don't get it. Uh, it, Who wants to weigh in on on insufficient intent? George, you you had something to say in the notes. Yeah, I'll I'll start and I'll make it really, really easy for everyone. I have got absolutely no (laughs) doubt that the rule that currently applies in AFLW will be applied in the not-too-distant future. Um, The the umpires are expected to somehow... um, get their heads inside the player's head as to whether they intended what they intended to do the, with the ball. In the AFLW, it's quite simple. If you kick the ball out or handball the ball out and it's not touched by someone else, it's a free kick to the other side. In between um, the arcs. In between the arcs, yeah, exactly. And yeah. Um, years ago, we didn't have out-of-bounds on the full and everybody complained bitterly about that. Uh, they don't these days. Everybody knows that if you kick the ball out of the bounds on the full, it's a free kick to the other side. Well, this is the next logical step. And it if you think about it, even in those circumstances that Andy's just described, it completely takes away any any doubt about whether it is or should have been or maybe. Um, it, it totally depends on what happens in the circumstances. And if there's any doubt about it, like in the AFLW, they throw it in. So yeah. um, uh, I would that, totally support them doing that because yeah. it's just ridiculous, you know, to have the variability of things. Like, just why don't you go to that? I mean, if that's where they want to go, then do it because it. I wouldn't mind that because it's clear, isn't it? Why not yeah. take one rule away and create some clarity around it? Um, because it's just it's ridiculous to have such a variable outcome for such what can be as we've seen this season it can be such incredibly important outcome yeah and the um the other thing that that uh happens as has happened in the aflw the players actually are then inspired to keep the ball in so yeah. there's so the ball's kept in play a lot more than than what it is at the moment you can you know bounce the ball towards the boundary line if there happens to be a player within vicinity at the moment and that sort of thing like that cell would kick um in that last couple of minutes um, there was no doubt he wanted to get the ball out. And, and, yeah, that, and was, that was the irony of the one that they paid to Gus, really. Yeah, yeah. Against Gus. Yeah, the, exactly. Yeah. I actually thought the umpiring was not too bad um, and um, generally. But there's some, again, it's a similar thing about the inconsistency. The free mm. kick against Nibbler, which actually turned out to be the one in the centre of the ground where he was tackled by two Geelong players. Yeah, that was a really important moment because they were sort of pushing. They were getting the upper hand, um, and we were getting forward of the ball in that contest. So it was just, he just had no time to dispose of it, and they're giving players so much time to um, get rid of the ball and still not playing holding the ball. To pay that is so frustrating, and it's a similar thing with the um, the sort of variability on the out of bounds. But the one against Oliver is ironically probably could have been called dropping the ball because it, the mm. ball hit the ground. But it's only because Oliver is so strong across the chest and obviously through the neck that his head didn't whiplash into the ground and get knocked out senseless. That was, it just drives me nuts with the the um, the way these things are, um, you know, the reporting of it. Not the uh, that that wasn't reported because wasn't it the previous week that Hawkins got away with a fine for a sling tackle? That's uh, um, no a similar sort of tackle, driving someone's head into the ground from behind. And didn't get suspended, did he? Didn't yeah, get well, no. obviously didn't get suspended. I'm not sure if he even got a fine. He he seriously could have hurt Oliver, uh, and it was just really that Oliver was strong enough to not let his head whiplash into the ground. Otherwise, he's gone. He's he's knocked out. Um, so you know, and for it then to also give the deliberate was just outrageous. But you know, to credit where it's due on the umpiring front. That was a. a absolutely 100% correct call for when Close smashed it into the um, yeah, so um, thing. That's what um, I was going to ask you uh, next, uh, that 50-metre penalty. Uh, I didn't actually know that it was a rule. I, I, I guess if the, I was in the opposition, I'd be angry if that happened to us. But um, given that other things that transpired in that match with the umpiring, I'm laughing all the way to top spot on the ladder. Um, yeah, so you're saying that... Um, that's totally uh, legit. Totally. That's and like, that's, all, and I, I mean, that's the thing that's it's interesting because some ones that rule about it, there's a degree of um, 
subjectivity, isn't there, about whether, exactly as you say, Andy, what's the mindset of the player? Are they trying to put it out? Are they showing insufficient intent? You know, you can argue about them. They're grey. Did they have a chance to get rid of it? That's a bit of an assessment of a snap thing. That one's a black and white um, decision. You are not allowed to do what he did, and it's an automatic 50. Um, it had it would have been a free if it wasn't um, on the full. And it, exactly what happened to... Um, uh, Melksham the previous week. Melksham, it was just out and he booted it um, up into the stands and then the free was given against him um, because it was already a free because um, it was kicked on the full. Um, it was a 50 metre for time wasting. That's a, you know, it's a better, it's a clearer rule than the stupid protected zone. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I, I would give full credit for the decision um, to pay that one because, um, and, you know, imagine how hard it would have been paid if there was a full um, stand. Um, but good on him for making the right call. Um, and they, they've only got themselves to blame Geelong for that last um, 45 seconds of, you know, what calamity. I mean, the, other, the other thing to remember is, uh, and we've spoken about the umpiring before in this um, vein, is um, until they make professional umpires, um, we will get those sort of anomalies within the game, you know, like whether... Whether the A and B one was was called correctly or not, whether the Cell one Selwood one uh, should have been in, uh, deliberate or not, um, what really really annoyed me about the um, uh, deliberate of Gus's was that it wasn't uh, Matt Stevick was the uh, central umpire. Um, he yes, didn't, it, yeah. he didn't call it. It was Craig Fleer who wasn't uh, went it went outside in. Uh, over the boundary line inside Stevick's area and Fleer, who was the forward umpire, called it as deliberate. Um, and I, I, if I was Matt Stevick, I would be appalled at, at that call in the first place because it wasn't his and secondly, it was wrong. Um, so I suspect that's why Stevick, who does know the rules, um, had no qualms about giving the 50 uh, metre penalty because... Um, uh, trying to even up the score, if nothing else, but it was a correct call. You can't punch the ball away or or dispose of the ball after it's gone over the boundary line. And ironically, another irony for that is that rule is because it's a time wasting um, mm. exercise. Um, whereas the, which is funny because the clock stopped, but I, I'm guessing the sort of some that that's the logic of it is. But in with no crowd, there's a footy right there, presumably. Um, I'm not sure how close. So you um yeah, it's a clear rule. Um, you know, he, I, I, I'm, some people say, well, it's not fair on um, close, wasn't it? Um, that yeah. he didn't know where he was. Even Scott said in the um, presser afterwards that, you know, we, we coach our players to smash it over the boundary line and, you know, and how could he tell where he was? Well, there's bloody AstroTurf. <laughs> you know, mm. he, he, but it's grass on one side of the line and it's AstroTurf on the other side of the line. He... You know, if he didn't know, that's not, you know, what do you not give it to to him if, you know, if you think that he might not have been sure, well, tough luck. The, the other thing that was interesting about that whole episode, that whole 10 or 15 second episode was, uh, I thought it was brilliant from Petrarca uh, when Guthrie had the ball. Uh, bringing it back in, Petrarca didn't go and stand the mark. He stood five metres away so that when the play on call came, because Guthrie was trying to absorb as much time as possible, Petrarca went at him full bore and that caused him to kick the ball sideways to give the out of bounds. So again, just smart, smart thinking, smart footy IQ at the right time of the game. Yeah, I'm really glad you said that because I was going to say exactly the same thing, George, when we talk about the last minute, because that, it, it, it speaks to the same thing that I was saying about the discipline. At the very first, um, in the first 30 seconds of the game, Track got, um, had, um, he was one of the players that manned the mark, deliberately took a step inside the line before they called um, Stan, which they're taking a long time to call Stan now, used that time to move towards the corridor. And I thought to myself, they're on here, that's, that's discipline. Right at the end of the game, when the game was there to be, you know, won or lost, he had the discipline not only to not man the mark, um, Guthrie sort of wedged catch 22 to himself because he was sort of gesticulating to the umpire about something. And the umpire called play on. And as you said, it was so, it's such good discipline and so smart by track as he just charged it. He almost got him. He almost sort of touched him before he released it. And I don't think Guthrie was fully switched on to that 
that that might happen and was under pressure enough to kick it on the full. It was a, you know, shank, really. Um, so that was spot on. That was a good pickup, George. That's, I thought the same thing. That was really disciplined, smart, um, and ultimately um, a big factor in us winning the game. Absolutely. All right. I um, feel like I've relived uh, the whole game again. Get emotional. <laughs> uh, for- Just with that reliving it, Andy. Um, you know, all of that. If though, if it weren't for that burst of goals by Geelong to get it out, it wouldn't have. You know, if we didn't come back from forty-four points, it wouldn't have quite the same sort of legendary vibe, would it? No, but that's why it does have that legendary vibe. Yeah. Um, that's why we go to the football. That's, that's right. why we go to the football. Well, or not as the case may be. <laughs> minor premiers, something that's never happened in uh, in any of our lifetimes. Um, so yeah, well done to us. <laughs> just <laughs> a couple of thing, just a couple of comments on some players. I thought Smith had a serviceable game. Nothing probably, you know, did his job, allowed Lever to, to um, zone off. Um, you know, I think his stats were pretty quiet, but he took a nice couple of marks, spoiled um, pretty well. Um, and the other one that a shout-out to was uh, Captain Jack Sparrow, I thought, um, apart from um, the brain fades of uh, kicking the man in the mark, I thought he was pretty strong. Um, and he's, he's, he's got good hands, hasn't he? He takes a good mark. There was one mark he took which I thought for sure he was not going to... In fact, I thought he hadn't took, taken it under um, pressure from Guthrie. Um, really, really sticky hands. Uh, yeah, he's got fantastic hands. And um, I've been looking at uh, uh, highlights throughout the year and it's a few times he's bobbed up with some really good hands. <laughs> now, we're just going to try one more time. I think we've got D Zephyr who's been trying to... Uh, uh, call in. He's telling me he can hear us in the chat room, so I think I've got it working, but we'll see in a second. D Zephyr, is that you? Yes. Oh, Gentlemen, how are you? Fantastic. I, I fixed it on the fly. Uh, that's uh, that's really good. <laughs> the, uh, it, it turns out that one of the cords wasn't plugged in all the way, so that'll do it every time. How are you, D Zephyr? What, what, uh, what do you want to say? Oh, I'm very well, thank you. Um, like most of us, just a, a couple of points. Um, I've, I watched the last quarter replay several times, and what gets lost in the moment was um, even though the goals came in a in a hurry, our calmness kicking the ball was just unbelievable. I saw the stat we went by eighty one eighty one percent by foot in the last quarter, which that's I'm guessing that's pretty high. That's remarkable, yeah, oh. for that late in the game, yeah. Uh, well, for the well, days at any game. point in the last 30 years, that's, that's <laughs> remarkable. Yeah, was, and seeing a bit of dew on the ground, I thought, God, how clean are we? And, and the kicks weren't rushed. Um, anyway, it was wonderful. But uh, the main guy I wanted to talk about was Charlie Spargo. Um, there was a talkback caller on SCN last week who absolutely ripped into him for milking for free kicks. And um, watching him get those two goals in that last quarter, and he's so clever. His footy brain is amazing. And that turn of speed to, to beat three Geelong players to the goal line after Henry Henry spoil, it's like <laughs> time stood still. I thought it was very important in that last quarter. And I, just, I thought of that talkback caller when I saw Spargo kick those two goals and in the end when we won. I just think he's had a ripper season. Because he plays one of the hardest positions on the ground. And just wanted to get your thoughts on Charlie. Yeah, I don't think he plays for free kicks. I think because of his height, uh, or lack thereof, uh, it might appear that uh, he doesn't duck, but he gets taken high sometimes in tackles. And that happens, you see, to Caleb Daniel and, and other players of that uh, sort of height and stature. Um, so, yeah, I don't think he, he milks it. He's not a milking player. He's a, t- he's a tough Footballer, he, he doesn't uh, doesn't share contests. Uh, guys, what do you think? Yeah, I reckon he hit the nail on the head. Uh, these are in terms of footy IQ. He's so, so evidently a smart footballer um, and a natural footballer. Um, so he's, you know, I also agree. I think that he those small forward pressure players. You know, it's feast or famine, isn't it? Um, it's such a hard, you know, historically that's just about the hardest position to play in terms of being able to consistently 
impact the match, but it will impact the match in terms of scoring. It's all that pressure acts that are the, the critical things. I thought DeLong made a couple of really bad defensive errors through that whole game. And obviously the very last um, play of the game was a really shocking breakdown of defence. But that one that you mentioned, to let Spargo run onto that and kick that through, that was just poor defence. And the other one was another small forward, the very first goal of the game, to allow Cozzy to run boundary side through that pack at pace and have no one goal side of that contest to, to stop him. And he, him able to run directly into a goal was another really um, poor defensive breakdown for you know one of the best defences in the league. But no, I'm with you on, on uh, Charlie. Um, and he's a, a sort of tough player, I think, that he, he's another one that will thrive in finals and did in 2018, didn't he? Yeah, just, just to add, add a little bit more to that, um, DZ, you're absolutely right. It's one of the hardest pl- uh, positions to play on the ground, um, especially the way the game's played these days, that the, those small forwards are almost expected to cover the whole whole ground for the whole game. So the sad part about not being actually at the match and watching it on television is that you don't see what one probably probably 90% of what someone like Spargo is doing in the game until the ball finishes up in the forward pocket or something like that. It's what they're doing around the ground and up the ground and getting in the defensive positions as the, when the opposition have got the ball. Um, they have to be really hard workers, but you're right about Charlie. He's, he's a natural IQ footballer who knows how to weight his kicks, how to get into the right position. It's no small thing that he kicks two goals out of out of uh, uh, packs like he did in this in this particular game, and actually handed off a couple of others um, to other other players. He's just a smart player in the right position at the right times. They are absolutely gold. Those type of players when when you get into finals, um, we will talk about the Eddie Betts and the Silvery Olies in the past. They're playing exactly the the same type of role, and um, that's that's the sort of output that these players can can produce in finals and like I just said they are absolute gold he got two goals in that last quarter didn't he Dee Zephyr yep uh, yes he did um, yeah. yeah and the second one with I think mean, it was three Geelong plays were rushing at him quickly to, to manage to get the ball on boot so quickly and snap mm-hmm. it over their hands you know that he's kind of born with that skill yeah I was thinking oh, I enjoy the watching how quickly he got it to, to the boot it was incredible wasn't it yeah, yeah, it really was. Um, but, jeez, what a game. <laughs> Still can't believe it. <laughs> how, how was your reaction um, when, when, we, when Max kicked that goal? Oh, goodness. There's, uh, with, there's six of us in this house. Um, <laughs> it was, we jumped so loud and, and screamed that it, it interrupted their recording. My TV froze <laughs> for a few seconds. <laughs> Boards were just there. It was just euphoria. The kids were nearly in tears jumping. It was there. It, like many lounge rooms, I'm assuming it was just brilliant. I oh, just, I thought I was going to pass out uh, ten seconds after the goal. <laughs> we were that excited. It's the best best way to to win a game. I mean, it's not good for the heart or whatever. As I said, I'd like to just comfortably win a game, uh, but yeah, the feeling is um, is fantastic. Uh, Dee Zephyr, did you see the um, uh, interview with Petrarca after the game on seven? I'm going to play it in a minute. So uh, if Dee Zephyr, <laughs> yeah, I'm going to play it now. So Dee Zephyr, stay on the line. Uh, I might just, I'll turn down your audio uh, for a second. Uh, but uh, yeah, I'll pl- you'll be able to hear it as well. And then I'll bring you back on. Hi. No problem. I'm pretty emotional right now, to be honest. Um, yeah, 57 years and uh, something the club has been building for a long time. And yeah. Um, that's for every fan right there, Melbourne fan who's been, you know, um, embarrassed to sort of wear the Melbourne Footy Club logo and, um, you know, to put the club back on the map and to be first is um, something that we've strived for for a long time and um, to be a part of this is just, um, yeah, it's, it's unbelievable to be honest, yeah. And, and it is an unbelievable win, Christian. You've kicked six goals to nil against Geelong, down at Geelong. I mean, they've won 90% of games down here to, to put you on top of the ladder. As you say, what what was said at three quarter time? Do you just go back to, hey, we're a good team, we win contested footy, let's surge the ball forward? Um, we felt like at uh, half time, it was just around the clearances, and um, us as mids, where we were, uh, we got smashed to be honest, and uh, we got a good reality check and, at half time, and um, we missed a lot of tackles, and um, we knew they're, they're an unbelievable team. Um, they've been an unbelievable team for you know ten plus years now, so. 
Um, for us, we just need to grind away. <laughs> we knew that our best footy is, is being at- aggressive and, and hunting the ball and, and putting pressure on them, and we just felt like we, you know, the scoreline sort of sort of took care of itself. We just, you know, kept grinding and grinding, and, um, you know, one goal after another, and, um, yeah, and then from there, just sort of a bit of momentum and... Um, and of course, a bit of luck goes your way. And, um, yeah, big Maxi. I'm so proud of him um, to, to kick that. It's just awesome as captain. Track, he's so emotional. It has been an amazing journey for you, for the football club. It's been on its knees. It was belted for years, and suddenly you're finishing as minor premiers. You've seen the highs, you've seen the lows. Is that what's bringing tears to your eyes? Yeah, it is. I mean, this is, you know, look at, it, look at our coach. I mean, you know, six months ago or 12 months ago, he was going to get sacked. I mean, everyone in the media was saying that. And, and now to, you know, to be probably the best coach and coach the best team at the moment um, at the first place is amazing. But we know job's not finished. We've got, sec- you know, season two coming, and that's what we're aiming for. And, um, you know, we want to harness this energy. This is an amazing feeling, something that, you know, we've probably never felt before. So um, the feeling like this, we need to keep going. Um, and we've got finals next week against the team, you know, in Brisbane who are in great form. Uh, that was uh, Christian Petrarca. Could you actually hear in the background of that, uh, they, they seem like they still had the fake crowd noise going. <laughs> I don't know why they decided uh, to do that. Um, yes, yeah, so emotional. Uh, I think uh, you, you, you know where his heart lays. He's going to be a demon for life and uh, that emotion was probably felt by all of us in our, in our homes as well. It was awesome, wasn't it? I had a tear in my eye with his had a tear in his eye. It was like the, you know, his comment about his coach and how much, you know, the, the, the players love him was so evident when they came off the ground. Um, he, you know, I thought, and Petrarca's just matured. It's like, you know, think of the kid who, when he first got drafted and, um, you know, he's become not only a mature player, he's a leader. Um, at the end of that interview, he thanked them uh, as they're all, they all seem to, but like, you know, he said, thanks for having me, you know, so it's, it's just good culture stuff. And I don't know if you noticed, but the um, players came in, sung the song, and I think it was him, but someone yelled out, there's no masks. And he went and got the bag of masks and handed them out. And I thought, you know, that, that's just the little things that show good character, but also great leadership. Uh, Steve Zephyr, you want to add anything else about that or anything else? Oh, that, yeah, that was brilliant. He's just yeah, genuinely top bloke. He's, yeah, he, what else can you say about him? He was almost as if he was t- talking on our behalf. And I know a lot of people were saying during the week, oh, minor premiers and, you know, not, don't necessarily go on to win the flag. But that, like, just ask yourselves, how important was it, you know, at the end when we won that game, we finished on top for a team that's been starved of success. You know, I... I so many Melbourne supporters would just be so proud of what they've given us this year, especially in these times. It, it's, we really can't describe it. I mean, I there's a lot of hard work ahead in the next month, but geez, the, the, the team bonding was evident in the first, you know, half of the season, how they played for each other. And if you, if you watch the replay of, um, after Max kicks the goal, I've watched it that many times just to see each player's reaction Yep. Yeah, and and awesome. who they hug and who they jump on. It's just amazing. It, <laughs> yeah. Can I, what can I ask can you, you say? Zepa, where, where you rank that win in Demon wins that you've seen over the years? Oh, it, it's, it's top two for sure. I remember the qualifying final in 2000, West Coast in 18, but I'd say this tops it off. This was just, <laughs> how can you script it? First versus the second, you just, yeah, it's probably the best. It has to be. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> that, I agree with you. The that qualifying final uh, for me as well. Um, the I was young in '88. Uh, that was great, making the grand final. Um, also beating North, we thumped them, and like uh, at half time, I knew we were in the grand final, so I just enjoyed the the whole match. But we've never won like this, you know. Um, first versus second to win the minor premiership, uh, you know, 44 points down. Uh, it, it was fantastic. Um, C- certainly was. Uh, just quickly, was that – that was our third, third uh, top two clash this season? Yeah, we, we twice – yeah. 
Yeah. Twice played the Bulldogs and now uh, Geelong. So uh, we won two of them, lost one of them, obviously. Um, but then we are able to get uh, top spot back. Um, so fantastic. Yeah, Anything brilliant. else, Dee Zephyr? No, uh, that's it, gentlemen. I'll let you get on with the show, and uh, thanks for your patience. <laughs> no worries. No, look, I'm happy I worked it out because it should just work when you plug it in. It should work. The cord at the back came out. So, yep, no for next time. That's the first thing I should check. All right. <laughs> thanks, T Zephyr. Appreciate the call, and uh, we'll thanks chat. Thanks for the call, D Zephyr. Chat soon. <laughs> no worries. Good night, gentlemen. No. That was uh, D Zephyr, been a, a demon lander for a long time. Um, so let's uh, move on to uh, finals. Uh, thoughts on um, thoughts on the venue. Uh, was there another venue you would have preferred? Obviously not the MCG because uh, obviously that's not a um, an option for us. Also, who did you want to play in the first week of finals? Are you happy to be playing Brisbane? Would you have preferred to have played the Dogs off three losses? Uh, that was a remarkable game, both the Dogs game and the Brisbane game. Um, or would you have liked to have gone to Port and play them in uh, you know, with a hostile crowd? I'll start with you, George. Um, if you ask me that in the third quarter of the game, <laughs> of course, uh, I was anticipating the Port game against the hostile crowd. Um but look, I, I think Adelaide is the best and, quite frankly, the only option that um, the club would have been, uh, entertained. We, we wouldn't have been wanting to play Brisbane in Brisbane or even the Gold Coast under any circumstances. Why should we fly up there and give them all the advantage? <laughs> That's, um, it was never an option, I don't think. Never, so, yeah, yeah, eliminate that as an option. You can eliminate Perth as an option as well because yeah. it's, you know, uh, first week of the finals, you, you're looking at a three-hour flight one way, four hours the, the next Um uh, overnighting all the problems associated with quarantine um, with Western Australia. Um, so write that one off. <clears throat> Don't want to really be playing in Tassie. Um, uh, we want to play on a ground that's that's big. Uh, I think the Adelaide Oval um, is almost identical in size to the MCG. That suits our style of play. And why shouldn't you make the uh, opposition travel from from Brisbane just that little bit further to Adelaide, take them out of their comfort zone. We've performed well at Adelaide over the last couple of years, beaten both the teams there um, in recent times. So, yeah, it's, Adelaide was, for, for me and I think for the club, the only real option given that we uh, beat Geelong. It would have been horrible the other way around, I think. Um, and it'll be interesting to see how Geelong go in exactly that circumstance and we'll be able to look back and say, yeah, um, wasn't that good because I suspect Port will do them. Um, so uh, as, as far as the opponent, I'm happy to play Brisbane at the moment. Um, I watched a lot of the um, Brisbane game um, uh, against West Coast. West Coast um, are a shadow of what they were before and um, uh, while Brisbane won the game the question was whether they would get sufficient points to um, to get over the line which they did courtesy of a, a timekeeper and all sorts of other problems yeah. but we won't go down that path um, anymore but uh, Brisbane aren't what they were earlier on in the season the loss of hip wound I think has seriously affected them uh, Danaher is um, flighty at the very best um, He's in and out of the game. He doesn't really contribute as much as what people suspect he does. Um, you've got to worry more about the people like uh, McStay um, Cameron. Up and Cameron up forward. Cameron's actually, uh, I think he's uh, only a goal or two behind um, Bailey Fritch mm. in terms of output um, for the season. They're only, only half a dozen goals behind... Um, people like Tom Hawkins that everybody uh, raves about. So, uh, yeah, you've, you've got uh, uh, some players that you do have to stop. And the last time we played Brisbane, we stopped those players. You know, that you shut down Daniel Rich. Um, he had 29 possessions against the West Coast. Unbelievably, they, they let him go free and he yeah. cut them to pieces. Uh, and you've got to stop Zorko and Neil in the middle. But um, we've got the talent uh, in Petrarca and Oliver to be able to do that. Um, but they've only got the one ruck in McInerney at the moment. Um, so I think uh, Jackson will prove to be a, a real critical factor in this game. But So overall, I much prefer to play Brisbane. Um, I, I really wouldn't have wanted to play the Dogs. They would have 
really stretched us, I think. Um, they're struggling without Bruce up forward um, and they're not what they are. And I, sus- I also suspect there might be something wrong with Bontempelli as well. Uh, but they're just as likely to come out and <laughs> belt their opposition this this coming week. But, yeah, very happy to play Brisbane, make them do all the travel and all the hard times and, and things like that. And we're in, we need that big, nice big ground. Um, and we don't don't need to be um, in front of Brisbane supporters or people. Even if we'd gone to the Gold Coast, it'd be uh, a full ground of Brisbane supporters. So we don't need that scenario to occur. Uh, big man, uh, you can take the same type of questions: venue, opposition. Uh, I, I, if I was choosing personally a, um, a ground anywhere in Australia other than the MCG, I'd pick um, Adelaide Oval in a heartbeat. Um, a friend of mine was talking about, or well, would we pick at um, Alice Springs? As much as that's a nice venue, it's not a proper footy ground. Well, AMAC, AMAC, AMAC in the chat room has said would have loved Alice Springs to reward the community up there, but it's it's not a big enough. You may as well play it at the MCG with the crowd that you're going to get there. But yeah, yeah. Well, more the more the point. I mean, I, 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 well, one, it's a it's a pain in the neck to travel to. It's mm. only what a half an hour flight to Adelaide. Um, so there's that aspect, but the weather. Um, um, isn't you know really wind isn't really a factor at Adelaide Oval because of the stands. Whereas you play in Tassie or the um, uh, Alice Springs or any of those sort of grounds, you're introducing a potential variable that um, you're not at Adelaide. And Adelaide's got you know the best surface outside the MCG. So um, and there's something too I think about um, Goodwin returning there. I can't recall is Goodwin an Adelaide boy. I know he played in Adelaide, but um, obviously, is he from Adelaide? Oh, let's look that up uh, while you're talking. Keep talking. And I'll... I had assumed he was, but that might be because he played in Adelaide. But you know, so there's that connection there as well. Yep, Adelaide, um, South Australia. Yeah, I'd so say there's that, and we've under Goodwin, we've got a good record there, and I think that's partly because you know I think it's really important. George's point about the size of the ground um, it really brings our comparative advantage against other teams, the the size of the ground, because we're fitter, we're faster, we can expose um, teams, um, and our defensive system comes into its own on the big ground, more so insofar as it's so much better than the oppositions who get exposed by that um, um, that how of space, because space is sort of an anathema to, um, to zones. It's like the... Kryptonite, no, sorry, yeah, to zones the kryptonite for it because if you're not on, there's lots of holes to come through. So, um, you know, whereas the Geelong was a classic example, is that you know that you could run a zone there that was effective with basically not moving. So, I think it plays into our hands. We've we've played well there there this year, even in that Crows game that we lost, we beat Port there. So it hold those fears. Uh, you know, I think George, you make a good point about the risk of um, dogs rebounding, but geez, they were. But they were woeful against Port Adelaide. That was they were terrible. Um, Port weren't much better. That was an average game of footy, I have to say. Um, you, you know, you're right. They could, they've got the ability to bounce back, but you know, they've taken away their one wood. They've you know dropped off a cliff in terms of their ability to win clearances. So I give Essendon a real chance of winning that game. Um, Brisbane. You know, it's interesting that 1v4 is there's a big gap, for, particularly for a team um, that's sort of coming up from fifth. They have won, you know, haven't beaten anyone in the top eight. I think that's a real factor, whereas, as you know, we've talked about, Ds have beaten everyone in the top eight. Um, so we're a better footy team. Um, I think we have we match up well against them. We're, they're very big on contests, big on stoppages. I'll be interested to see if they bring up another extra to the stoppage to match that, but I don't think they will. Um, not at the Adelaide Oval, at least. Um, I agree, George, that Hipwood out's huge for them. Um, so they've got who's their the McStay, McStay, um, yeah. and who's their other two talls? They're running three Dan, talls. Dana, uh, Dana, obviously, and, and, and the occasionally uh, Berry. Barry, yeah. So I think, you know, Smith will sit on Barry or something because all the top teams, it was interesting when I was thinking about Smith coming in that third um, tall, all of the top five teams, in fact, have got running three tall forwards, including Medivh. So, um, you know, you engineer it so you get Lever um, intercepting. I think even McStay, Smith could take McStay. He's not a natural. He's a good, got good hands, but he's 
not a sort of natural forward. Uh, I totally agree, George, that I reckon Danaher's uh, overrated. He can be damaging, but he, he comes in and out of games. Um, well, our intensity will match them at the, what, you know, their one wood is their contest. Uh, they're also a territory team. They like to get it forward. Um, we play well against teams who have similar strengths to us because we can match them in each of those areas. Um, and you're right about the dogs because they play differently. If they get it on their own terms and really fire, well, they've got the ability to beat anyone. So, um, you know, it promises to be a good game, obviously, And um, but I'm pretty confident we'll, we've got the, you know, we've got what it takes to beat them. Do we make any changes? Um, and who do we play on Cameron? Um, Hibbard has sort of taken those players in the past. Yeah. I, I'll, I'll take this one. I, yeah. I don't think we have to worry. I, I think... Um, this is the downside of not being able to see the games. People tend to fall into this trap of thinking that defence is the same as what it was 10 years ago. Um, part of zone defence means that you take the bloke who's there at the time. So um, you, you'll you find during the game, let's, let's use the Brisbane example, um, at some stage May will be on Cameron. Sometimes Smith will be on Cameron. Sometimes Petty will be on Cameron. I think we've taken the... Um, the whole defensive zone to the next level. Um, so I'm not, I'm not worried about individuals like you, like you used to be when players played on indi- on one-on-ones. Uh, it, it has changed and unfortunately we don't get to see it because we're watching on television. But you saw it in, the, in, in this game against Geelong. Um, at time, uh, who, who was on Gary Rowan? You couldn't have said that anybody really was. You know, you you had even Hawkins. You know, was on May at some stage. Um, May was on Hawkins pretty much most of the game for a lot for a lot of the time. Yeah, and, and sometimes but, causes but, a mismatch because I saw Langdon yeah. on one of their tools of you know got caught yeah, out. Yeah, but that's that's the nature of zone defending, and I yeah. think uh, they've worked out that um, the percentage. Uh, the percentages of playing that way are far more, far better than than the one on one type of thing. So I'd be really surprised if Hibbert came came back in. Smith did his role, and that's all that they've required um, from everybody during the during the year. Just play your role, do the thing, and as long as they match in with um, the rest of the defenders in the in that zone and know how to to back each other and and move to the right spots at the right time, then they'll stay in the side. Um, So it'll be interesting um, from Hibbert's perspective because he's out of contract at the end of this year. Um, uh, If he doesn't come back in this game, I'd say that uh, that may well be the end of of his time um, at the club, um, given his age as well. So um, I don't think... I don't think there will be any changes down back. I've, the the big question for me is, I don't think you can leave James Jordan out of that mm. side. There's too much talent in that player. Were you surprised uh, he was left out this week, or was that just yeah. managing him? I think that was finals. managing. Yeah, you know, again, yeah. you don't leave a talented player like that out, who the previous week had got certainly um, above twenty plus possessions. You don't leave them out for um, for uh, the quality of their performance. Uh, no, I agree. He's like batting, he's, run. He's batting Sparrow is probably going to have to make way despite having a yeah, decent but, game. But I, think, yeah. but I think Sparrow did more than enough and, and we're getting games into Sparrow at the right time. So, so it's, it's going to be out? a horrible decision <laughs> for that. I, I don't know. I honestly don't know this week who you, who you can possibly yeah. drop out of that side. It'll be Sparrow, I reckon. That's how they've set it up for sure in the sense that, that Sparrow actually played a bit more time on the ball than I, I thought he would. But essentially, he also played a bit off that halfback flank. It's they, Jordan will, I think Jordan will come in for Sparrow. Pretty unlucky for Sparrow, but I'm, presumably they will have talked him through that. And um, I totally agree, George. Jordan's in our best 22 Come final time, you want your best 22. He's struggled in the last few weeks. He's clearly sort of, um, you know, his tackling's dropped off a little bit and um, it's a big season for a, a player in essentially his first season, uh, first senior of, season of senior footy. Um, yeah, I, 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 they'll bring him in. I can't see someone else coming out. Um, but Sparrow, and he's awfully unlucky. Um, but that's how our role, and he'll be, you know, he'll be part of that group of players, Sparrow, that will, you know, stand as... 
you know, in a, a frame for a premiership for the next four or five years. So uh, he'll get plenty of time um, and opportunity, but um, Jordan is a must to bring in. They won't, Hibbards won't be brought back in. They don't, Smith wasn't brought in to experiment late in the day. You don't do that in round 23 in a must win game. And, um, you know, I think that he's just got that extra pace that gives him some flexibility in how they use him. And, um, you know, he'll do even better, I think, against uh, Geelong, uh, sorry, Brisbane's forward line. The Geelong have got a genuinely star studded forward line, haven't they? Those talls. Um, so, you know, I think that he's toe, his ability to get to contests and interrupt, you know, marking contests and get up the ground if he, if he needs to, um, makes Smith probably at this stage of the season. He's got a bit more sort of diamondism than, um, than Hibbo. And, yeah, you might be right, George. He might have played his last game um, potentially, sadly, for, for Hibbo. And the other one that's a bit sad, obviously, is Jonesy's not going to get back in, is he? No, no, barring catastrophic, uh, I think, injuries. Um, uh, most likely if that happened, we wouldn't be... Um, would have been going further in the competition. So uh, that's unfortunate for Jonesy. I mean, for a player who's, uh, you know. Yeah, for a certain <laughs> of the club. Um, I, I wouldn't mind them taking him over. If it ends up we go, we're go, we going to Perth, I, I wouldn't mind taking him with us um, and being the guy to present us with a cup. <laughs> I think we would want to do that, but uh, I, I'll nominate I think it. I think when we go to Perth from the sounds of things, you know, if we're in the prelims and, and or the grand final, we'll do the same as what we did the yeah, last time, and that's take a series of players over there, um, yeah. particularly if you've got a quarantine. And, and we've also got uh, probably a pre-season, sorry, a pre-finals bye that's indicating that there'll be a gap between the preliminary and the grand final. So you're going to need a squad of players over there as much as you can to just to get some training practice in with the players. Um, so, yeah, he'll, he'll be over there with the squad and you know, we've got three, maybe four games that are going to be very hard fought uh, over the next couple of weeks and um, injuries may still well occur in, in these uh, intervening times. So, um, yeah, there's still an opportunity for, for all of those players that we've mentioned. Um, let's talk um, the run, the run home uh, as it as it stands. Um, we have um, obviously we've got Brisbane. If we win, go we go into the preliminary final. But if we lose, um, we if we lose, we play either the winner of the Bulldogs and Essendon. Do you have a preference there, guys? Uh, if we have a loss, <laughs> we'll talk about first. You have you haven't learned, have you? I'm Andy? still doing my ladder predictor, right? As we what, what's happened to your ladder predictors up to this stage? And well, having ladder predictor um, how, how could I have forecasted <laughs> that the Western Bulldogs would lose the last three in a row? Um, yeah. How could I? I mean, I, I did, didn't predict that Richmond uh, would fall in a heap. Uh, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I, Anyway, uh, the, the question the is, is, we take a me, loss, would, who do we want to play, sure. Bulldogs, Essendon? Well, the short answer is the Bombers only because the Dogs are a better footy team and um, you want to avoid them if you can. And so if the Bombers get up and win that game, you know, the They'll have done brilliantly. The history of when that happens is they almost invariably get smashed in the, in the uh, next game, don't they? So... And then, uh, then uh, oh, George, do you, do you have uh, a preference? I, I don't really care, Andy. <laughs> not care, but the, for, for the very simple reason that Bin Man stated at the start of this program, we are the best team in the competition. It doesn't matter whether it's the Bulldogs or the or the Dogs or the Dons. Um, we are a better team than them. And on the day, particularly if it comes into a, a, a preliminary final stage, we will beat them. Well, preliminary final, if we do win this week, then our options are Sydney, uh, uh, Giants, Port or, or Geelong. Anyone, anywhere, anytime is the, right, the yeah. right, correct, yeah, well, only yeah. correct answer. Yeah. <laughs> my, You're not going to get us to bite, Andy. Yeah. My, Dad, my biggest, no one wants to biggest, play with the me. Te- the, team, the team that I reckon is the biggest danger in the final is the Giants. Um, they're starting to get back uh, all of those players that uh, have been injured during the season. They've still got 
uh, people like Callum Ward sitting on the on the sidelines due back. Uh, Mumford's um, coming in and smashing bodies every second week. Uh, they're giving him a good rest. Um, they're still they're winning games to get into the finals. Uh, I think they're the real danger coming coming in. The the talent that they've got and their abilities particularly with ball in hand, are as good as anybody in the league, including us. Um, but you know, they've, they've, they have been inconsistent during the season, but I think that was more about the injuries that they would suffered and the, the, and the losses that um, that causes um, within the, the structures that they have. So, um, But really not worried about anyone else at this stage other than them. No, I, I keep, agree. I, I rate them highly. I like them as a footy club too, and... Um, Happy to see them do well, but um, they've also got a bit of a really brilliant contested ball team, probably outside of Melbourne and Brisbane and Geelong, mm-hmm. the best almost, um, I'd say. And um, um, yeah, I, I reckon I'd, you know they've got a shot of. With, also, they've got that experience, don't they, George? Like they've yeah. been there about now for four or five years, and that's always a good sort of indicator of success is previous sort of experience in the finals. Whereas a team like Essendon. You know, obviously, don't have that, and, and I guess Northern Melbourne, lot by and large, that, that has to be said. So, that, you know, that's a factor on that. Andy Mel D's are into three seventy five to win the the flag, and um, you know, we were four fifty for five bucks before the Geelong game. So, um, interestingly, Geelong are four twenty now for the flag. They were favourites. Port Adelaide are five dollar favourites, but Port Adelaide are favourites for this game on the, the Friday night. So that's a weird sort of anomaly there. So when we make the grand final, who would you like to play? No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> won't, make, won't make you play those games. All right, the uh, All-Australian squad was announced today and the Demons uh, had the most players uh, selected. Uh, we had seven players, Bailey Fritch, Max Gorn, Jake Lever, Stephen May, Clayton Oliver, Christian Petrarca and Christian Salem. Was there anyone that was unlucky to make it and... Um, how many of those players will and who will make the final squad, George? Uh, out of those seven, I think we'd get five out of those. Um, uh, I haven't seen the rest of the squad, but it's usually an amalgam of, of the better players in the competition rather than positional sort of players that um, it should be. But, um, yeah, I think we'll get the Gorns, Olivers, Petrakas, um Levers and Mays. Do you reckon there. Lever and May will both get in? I have a feeling maybe just Jakey Lever. I think Stephen May might be unlucky to miss. Yeah, it's hard to it's hard to say. I think Mays had as good a year as any of the other backs. Um, Harris Andrews has has uh, was missing, I think, with the injuries in the middle of it. But they they don't they seem to forget about those sort he's, of things. But, Harris Andrews is not in contention, but I think Weedering okay. Weedering will uh, will get in. They'll they'll throw. Yeah. Oh, surely Steve May will get in well, on that. I, yeah, I think know. he should, yeah. but I'm just saying what I think yeah. will happen. Yeah, I, I, I think May will get in. I don't think the other backs have, have shown enough um, during the season. Um, he's, he was lucky, unlucky to, to miss out last year. Um, uh, but so they, they might come to their senses this year, but I think we'll get five out of seven in there. Salem would be um, lucky to get in um, yeah, simply because... Yeah, they yeah, just, they just yeah. run out of places to put people, mm. you know, in the end. So, but yeah, French won't make it. The one it, player but... that, sorry, Andy, the one player that is not unlucky but must have been in their thoughts was is Fritter. Um, you know, there's not you know close to fifty goals is pretty good return for a player playing that sort of medium sized third tall. Um, it's a good season of footy he's put in. Yeah, mm. yeah. Um, but rap that he he got that nod. I don't think he'll get in the. Oh, sorry, team. did he get? Oh, no, sorry, he did. He, he did. Right, no, okay, sorry. Uh, Fritch Gorn, Lever, May. Yeah, Oliver, right. Petrarca, sorry, I missed so, it. Yeah, no, he did get. He did yeah. get in. I don't believe he'll make uh, the no, final spot, but, but it's a good feather. It's, it's a nice feather in his cap. But uh, interestingly, uh, Richmond uh, did had no players in the team. Not saying they, they deserved it, but one. yes, there mm. you go. Doesn't take long, does it? I mean, even years when we finished at the bottom of the ladder, we still sometimes had, uh, you know, Maxi was making it, um, you know, the last couple of years. So there you go. Um, the other thing, uh, man, you'll be interested. This will be a stat right up your alley. alley. Um, 
This came off Twitter. The team with the most All-Australian squad members hasn't won the flag since 2015. Oh, my um, God. In 20, 2021, we've got seven. Uh, 2020, Geelong and Port both had five. 2019, West Coast had seven. 2018, Richmond had eight. 2017, Adelaide had eight. 2016, Adelaide had oh, six. And no, don't curse us anymore. Four, well, I'm not cursing Andy. you. I didn't make this uh, list. I'm just <laughs> the messenger, the humble messenger. Uh, 2015, Hawthorne had six. In this example, I'm going to shoot the messenger. <laughs> <laughs> you don't shoot the messenger. That's never happened. <laughs> So um, there you go, um, cursed all round. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, we've well, got our yeah. curse, and it's going to go. The Norm Smith curse is on its way out. Yeah, it's already finished. Norm um, Maxie put it to bed on Friday, uh, Saturday night. Yeah, certainly did. Um, anything else, boys? Before we uh, say goodbye. Well, that's all from me, I think. All from you, big man. That's it for me. All right. Thank you, George. Thank you, B-Man. Thank you, D-Zephyr. We finally got you uh, on uh, on the line. Uh, we'll be back next week, uh, hopefully returning triumph- triumphantly from Adelaide Oval. Uh, on, see you next week. Go Demons. Come Go Red Legs.